Okay, this is the meeting of the WTC Web RTC Working Group at TPAC 2023. And introductory slides. This group advised by the WTC Patent Policy. If you want to make a substantive contribution, you're supposed to be a working group member because that commits your your organization to the patent policy. There's a code of ethics and professional conduct that you are supposed to be, supposed to have read and they hear accordingly. That being reasonable is uh, not the uh, not the bad approximation. So let's keep it cordial. Health rules are see back physical. You're required to wear masks at all times. That's the rule. And if you're, and you're supposed to uh, do a daily COVID test, there's, uh, ki there's uh, kits available at the checking counter. And, and there are labels, stickers that you can put on your bag saying how close you want people to get. And if you see people wearing stickers, respect them. Nonetheless, be careful. Thanks. Wiki has been uh, has a link to these sites. If you haven't found them yet, that's where to look. And of course, we have the standard question: Do we have a scribe? Uh, I've started taking notes on IRC uh, since I'm not in the room. Uh, it'd be pretty good if someone could at least, at least make sure I'm not uh, misminuting or missing important things. So, volunteer for a secondary spread. That's right. Thank you. This morning. We have. Future scheduled meetings, October, November, December. So UN is going to take some notes in addition to the So this is our schedule for the meeting. So this is what we for the meeting. We're here until 4.30 today. There's a joint meeting with the SACG on Thursday, 5 to 6.30. And there's a joint meeting with a media workshop at 2.30 to 4.30 on Friday. The people who are not paying themselves on Friday, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Unfortunately, there was no room in the middle of the week for that. On Wednesday, there's breakout sessions. And uh, a few ones that deserve notice. There's a web RTC use cases and requirements of the high demanding real time communication scenarios. It's not clear what they, these are, but it's at 11 to 12 on Wednesday. And there's a relevant, relevant document that you can read before. HDR on the web is kind of interesting just because it uh, makes some demands on our encode decode ecosystem and the users value. So uh, that's some late on Wednesday. And there's an ITF link thing called the web codex serialization. Session on four to five on, uh, on Wednesday. That's actually uh, about uh, serializing and putting on the wire the metadata produced by web products in a way that is not linked to how it's encoded in RTP. 
of course, it would have been nice if uh, these were compatible somehow, but we'll see how that goes. We're using Zoom today, not our regular uh, Google Meets. So uh, we're using the we'll be using the raise hand tool in Zoom to get on the speaker's queue. And uh, if you're using Zoom in the browser, in fact, you, you, you will, in fact, be using web codecs over RTC data chat. So you're trying out an alternate stack than what uh, other people are using on, on uh, video conference. If you have a compatible browser, of course. And remember to state your name when you're speaking, especially with masks on there, it's not that easy to tell who you are. So that was the introduction. Uh, we've had schedule already. So this is the agenda. The important thing to notice is the lunch break. We're breaking at one and reconvening at two. Otherwise, uh, we have a slot at four, which is kind of set aside for follow up on uh, those things that we went over. So that will be decided upon by the, by the chairs and sometime, sometime before that. And we're ending the session at four thirty. And we'll try to be sticky as about uh, time boxing because experience shows that some topics have a very large ab ability to dig into a hole. Not that part, that part gives an ability to, uh, to uh, dig out again. So once, once we did, once time is up, we'll stop discussing that book. Possibly rescheduling for it for the, the next session. So, I'll spend a few minutes talking about the state of, of the working group, just to make sure that uh, people are, are on the same line. So, but what we see has succeeded in its ambitions, initial ambitions. We can now set up video and audio connections with reasonable quality between basically any browser and the And the dominant VC platform is uh, WebRTC protocols over RTP. It's also been used for a lot of things that are not video conferencing. For instance, the WIP protocol for recording. There's a lot of explorations of other protocols, media or web products or web platform and so on. But apart from the usage of that was mentioned of uh, web products or data channels and Zoom, these have not achieved significant performance action. So, the end of the game. I tried to look at which repos and which activities have had activities since the last piece. Media capture main. We're not adding new functionality until we've got the way. But we have done some, some things on it to remove it features that nobody implemented. For instance, we recently removed the ability to query for permissions on specific devices. Because nobody has implemented it. And the people who are most eager to, to say they needed it haven't implemented it either. We deleted that one. Media Pasture's extensions have been quite active, but it's basically a holding time for new ideas. And we're about to see PC, 
fixing bugs and merging some things from extensions. And we have introduced the means of marking up changes to WebRTC DC as uh, here's, uh, here's what the requirement, what the rec version says, and here's what the new version says. That's a pain to manage, but uh, it works. So that it's possible to say that this is the approved standard and this is the standard that, that uh, the work group assumes that they're going to follow. That is uh, behaving much like a living standard and that uh, we add stuff and we delete stuff. So uh, try to make simpler and Simple to read and simple, simple to figure out. And of course, we have a big discussion on that about the use cases. I call the transform new functionality. We're going to discuss that extensively. We have the web RPC eyes document where which has been thinking in the new direction by Samir. And uh, where the document didn't quite fit, so these are going into WebRTC extension system. You might want to kill off WebRTC eyes at some point. The, the document at some point. The need is there, but the, the direction is different. This platform processing effects and faces and so on. There's some synchronization with the media working group. I was listening to the the presentation yesterday about, about uh, video filters, which uh, link, seems to link strongly to our breakout box, but I couldn't quite figure out how they fit together. I haven't heard the document before, sorry about that. And of course, skin capture, which is largely pursued in the newly established SCCG, but we have a joint meeting on Thursday. And we have a bunch of things that are, haven't changed very much. Media capture transform, media capture record from element, image, priority, competent, SCC. SCC has been implemented. That's a good thing. So, uh, but we haven't changed it much in the last year. Some of these are unchanged because people are using them. And nobody cares to open them up again. Some of this are very stable because nobody nobody's implemented it and nobody cares. We should do some sorting on that category, category there. So that's the end of the slide where I have for current status of the group. In the 10 minutes to the end of end of slot. So comment commentary. Things that should have been on the, on the slides and isn't there? That's a good summary to me. Um, on one point, you said media capture main is close to rec. And uh, I certainly hope so. Yeah, I think those are rec for two years now. So exactly, and I was looking at the uh, issues, we still have like 30 issues open. And uh, I was wondering whether we should create them and move them to media, media capture extensions or tag them as broker for context recognition or do something to actually, uh, as a group, to say, okay, let's do some effort to finalize media, media capture the next. So I don't know if there's a. I think we should. Uh, I have done on the queue. Done. Uh, yeah, so let me first maybe reply to Yuan's comment, and then uh, I'll bring up the other comments I wanted to bring. Uh, so yes, Yuan, um, I agree with you. We need more triaging efforts on media capture main uh, without putting him on the spot. I think Yan Ivar has that in his to-do list. Uh, and I agree, some of them might be move to a v2 some of them might uh, be closed as no longer relevant but, but that's work that needs to happen before we can move to the to the next stage um 
the comment I wanted to make was about the previous slide, if you can um, scroll back. Uh, yeah, so in several of these repos, we've received uh, comments from the community asking about progress on the favorite uh, feature request that hasn't received attention, uh, which to me uh, feels uncomfortable. Uh, I think part of it is that indeed we don't have anyone that feels uh, responsible or as the main editor for, for those, but um, yeah, I, I would prefer if we didn't fall into complacency for, for these repos and made sure that we had a, a clear driver for each of those. So, um, hello, Jan over here. Just wanted to chime in that, uh, as far as I know, for me to capture main, there are no significant outstanding issues with the recent removal of the the uh, device IDs for permission. So if anyone uh, feels that there's a significant issue, uh, please state so in the issues. Uh, otherwise, we'll, I'm late in doing a triage run of, of, uh, of those issues. Thanks. Uh, one, one sticky issue, which is well, about the internationalization, which is uh, that the internationalization working group says that we ought to have a solution for language and direction of uh, human readable identifiers for devices. And uh, our response to you is to suggest something. And their response was, well, that depends. I visited the internationalization working group yesterday and found that they, they have a running discussion with uh, TC Internet about this. I think that kind of functionality in the, in the base JavaScript, but uh, that seems to be going quickly nowhere. So two years down the road, we still don't have a, have a, a recommended uh, design pattern that we can follow satisfy that requirement. I personally think that that's a situation that means that we should look should that possible to direct without satisfying that request. That's me. Let's see, no one has any fuel. I think that's the state of the world. And we can move on. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, this is Bernard, and also all the various slides will be handled by Harold and other uh, folks. So, uh, just picking up from where we uh, left, left it in uh, May and July, um, there were a few open questions that I'd like to get answers uh, from the group on. Uh, we did talk about these in July, but one was the relationship between this doc and explainers. Next. Um, and the question was whether should explainers link to the use cases uh, that potentially could clarify whether an API proposal is solving a use case. Uh, my recommendation um, that I'd like to get some feedback on is whether explainers, uh, I'm recommending that explainers and API proposals can link to the use cases but this not be required. And no links back the other way. Uh, let me put it this way. Are there objections to this recommendation? For me, that's good. Okay, next one is defining the relationship between this doc and issues. Next slide. So the question is, should a use case link to related issues? And the advantage is links, uh, you could link the requirements to specific issues which require resolution. Uh, we do do that in one or two cases, uh, uh, basically linking to issues raised in the CFC or to the CFC summary. 
but it's it doesn't occur in every every case only when we have um, it, uh, you, uh, requirements that are uh, still the subject of uh, still in progress to make clear what they are. Any objection to this? And I think we'll see in a minute why that might be helpful, but um, it just, just helps to get the uh, state of the proposal. Okay, the last one is the relationship between this doc and API proposals. Next. So here um, we have an API proposal and should a use case link to those proposals that could clarify whether a use case has proposals um, and links the use case to a proposal where you can track progress. The recommendation here is API proposals can link to the use cases, but you, we shouldn't require the use cases to link to the API proposals. Are there objections to this recommendation? I feel a little bit uh, leery about uh, use cases should not be required to link the API proposals because. Uh, if you have links from use cases to API proposals, that means that every time you you decide to uh, go for a different API proposals, you have to have to the use cases. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that kind of that's, that's a bit contrary. And so what well, was making the use cases so obvious? So what would you recommend, Harold? We have, we have as with both, so the issues that we had on Beaver but uh, it's a bit contrary. If we want to have use case be a very dynamic document, then this is useful. Do you have a recommendation? I would rather say that use, use cases should usually not link to API proposals. Okay. Anybody object to Harold's recommendation? Okay. All right. Uh, now on to the next slide and the actual extended use cases. So we're going to talk about uh, two main sections of the document today. One is 3.6 funny hats, a little bit of implementation feedback. And then we're going to talk about section 3.2, which is the low latency streaming section. Uh, next. So I guess, Harold, this is your slide. Yeah, I wrote it. So funny hats implementation. Uh, funny hats is a capsule for all this, all the stuff that's says so, uh, we take what comes out from the out of a camera or other source and decorate it somehow. This can include background replacements, uh, skin tone enhancements, uh, noise noise reduction, uh, decorations like the funny hats, original funny hats. And what we found is that in a, in a considerable number of cases, it's useful to send information from the entity that is doing the modification downstream with the video, saying that uh, this processing has been applied, or even sending information that says that I've done this processing, and if you want to do further processing, here's the information that I have gathered that you, you may need. For instance, we have uh, hardware face detection that might need to, need to send its information down to another part of the processing that does more accurate uh, outline, face outline for background replacement. Or we might have the option of background blur either in the source device or in an immediate device or even at the endpoint. Um, in order to make sure that none of these, that only one of these apply background blur to any frame, we should 
be able to send the information about the background where it had been applied. So that means we tie information onto the frame, which makes the frame not comply to the status for those kind of frames. So that means that we need to negotiate a transmission format that is not the standard frame format. And that means that we need the STP negotiation to say that both parts understand this standard format, designating now the frame as having the standard, dispatching the incoming frame to appropriate processing to recognize the extensions, control the decoding of the part of the frame that is video of the after it has been processed. And that means that factorization and defactorization needs to be under control. So I have a good idea of that. But uh, this is the use case, use case discussion. So this is appropriate for that use case, and it is obvious in that use case. That's um, So, Harold, uh, will will it be a PR for adding requirements to the uh, funny hats use case? I think we did talk about that at one point. I can I can take on the action item to write such such a requirements change. Yes. And I guess we'll also. <clears throat> have a section on metadata, which is related to this, right? The, the next session, we'll, we'll cover that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, I have to flip, flip slides to see the, see the hand, hand raised cube. No hand raised. Uh, so Harold, sorry, did you have a, Question: Something on which you wanted uh, approval, or mainly, mainly that uh, the working group agrees that there are some cases of uh, funny hats where where we need to send additional metadata frames. Are you planning to say which kind of metadata or kind of application? So. Because with funny hats, we know that we can rely on the metadata, it can be very abstract, or, and maybe to convince people, it's good to say, for instance, for XR or these kind of applications, the metadata is very important, it could be used. And so, on. so, part of life, like giving details about the kind of metadata. It's a bit, a bit harder that uh, we have done some experimentation with that. Of, of what maybe they didn't want to pass on. But we haven't uh, gotten to the point where we, are, we have, uh, like, if, if there are these five types of metadata, then we're okay. And this is, uh, some of it is actually overlapping in real uh, declaration, declaration stuff in, uh, that is pursuing in media. Um, so, also, like you said, for the background card, you like to have like multiple levels, right, at different places. Uh, do you think the metadata would contain information where where the effect took place, whether it's in a GPU or an NPU forward, totally somewhere above, like, and also the levels, or you no? Know? Is that Raju? Yes. Okay. Patrick here, uh, I have a question. With the metadata, are we mainly thinking application specific metadata or standardization specific metadata? That's a good question. I have uh, the metadata I've seen so far has been application specific. And then I don't see the need for application specific going away. Even if we standardize some types of metadata, I I think application specific makes the most sense. That's that's all. Awesome. Uh, everything. Assuming we have the appropriate 
show marks and the other places in the pipeline. It, uh, it does mean that, I mean, if the application specific, then I will of course, by definition, it doesn't do those things. So if we need interoperation, then uh, we need to extract the metadata that is that we need in preparation now. So, so hi, uh, Janova here. Um, sorry, did I miss the? I can't find to seem the seem to find the race hand symbol in Zoom. Maybe I'm missing it, but it's under reaction. It's a Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, just a quick question that um, for funny hats, I mean, the SDP negotiation seems to assume that we need to modify metadata in frames. And uh, for the purposes of adding metadata, um, another approach might be to uh, add some kind of synchronization info to data channels, for example. So um, that's the two ways to uh, add metadata. So I'm, I'm wondering if that presupposes a solution, but um, some detail on the, the actual use cases that would require metadata on frames, I think would be helpful. I think the issue with data channels is that you're not guaranteed that the data channel data has received, been received before the RTP data. And you want to correlate timestamps with the data. Right. Yeah, some kind of timestamping information would be necessary for, for that approach. That, that makes sense. But the, the, com the, the detail about having it before the frame, I think, is useful to clarify the need for this. Thanks. Hello. Oh, yeah. So the uh, next step, I think, is, is to get a PR um to articulate the requirements for this for the for the minutes i think yeah so actually i don't want me next one was low latency streaming okay so uh just uh, to bring everyone up to date, we have the section 3.2, which has two major use cases, one on game streaming and the other on low latency broadcast with fan out. We had a CFC on this originally starting in January uh, and uh, was summarized. And uh, we did have consensus for these use cases, but we had some issues, most of which have been closed. There are two open, so we're gonna try to uh, get the get uh, closure on those two uh, today. Next slide. Um, so we mentioned the first of the use cases in section 3.2 is game streaming. Um, and this is a summary of the requirements we have so far, um, basically in 15, 36, 37, and 38. Okay, next. Next slide. All right. So we, as I mentioned, we have uh, some open, two open, major open issues. One is issue 80. The other is issue 103. And then we have a PR to talk about, which is to clarify uh, some of the uh, things in, I think, uh, for the for game streaming requirements, uh, which uh, we will have some further discussion on. Okay. Next. So a little bit about 80. So what is what is it issue 80 about? Um, so issue 80 has been about, uh, well, one of the things in gaming is that you can have uh, things like spatial audio is becoming interesting. And so to do these new codecs, people need access to the raw audio data. They are doing this today in WASM. There's a couple of examples to that, but there's they're doing this using a hidden support for L16 in browsers. Um, rather than official mechanisms. And so FIPO suggested that an issue be opened and one was was opened in issue 80 uh, to figure out if, if there's something that should be in the standard rather than this kind of uh, hidden, hidden support L16, which is actually quite popular. Um, and so uh, this is the discussion we've had so far. Uh, Harold said, hey, 
couldn't we use media capture transform for this and uh, um, there are also some other issues potentially relating to wasm codex i think some of which harold just talked about um, so this is what issue 80 is uh, next slide and so the question is should we add a requirement for access to raw audio data um, I guess that would be, uh, do, do we need something else? Um, that, as I mentioned, this kind of uh, hidden uh, functionality, the L16 is quite popular um, and it is it is uh, important for, for gaming, for things like spatial audio. Um, and then uh, Harold just talked about uh, some, some other aspects of this. So we'd like to get feedback from the group about uh, where, where we should go to uh, address this raw audio data requirement, which I think is probably real for game streaming. Uh, so Harold. I, I have a couple of questions about uh, this requirement. I mean, the first one is, of course, what is raw audio data? I mean, uh, it's 16 bit samples at 48 uh, k it's raw data, then we should, uh, then the requirement is really to enable L16. Uh, and access to doesn't, uh, isn't clear about whether it's at the sender side or the receiver side. So uh, that uh, impacts on whether it's uh, needed to pass across the wire. Yeah, I think uh, if you, we go back to the original issue, I think it's more of a sender side thing than a receiver side thing. But there are some receiver side requirements because it's going to be a different codec, like you you mentioned. Yeah, so uh, the custom codec case that also fits neatly in the STP managing requirements, which I think we have uh, delineated. I mean. As you can see, the list of uh, potential requirements is identical from the previous track. Right. Um, the title is not right. Access to your data, that's not the target. The target is to uh, have pluggable codecs, pluggable codecs. So that, that's basically the requirement. Like, that's what you want to fight for. That should be climbed by there in this in this case. Maybe I'm missing something else, but it's but it's uh, something else because access to audio data, uh, your workload is providing you that on the standard side. On the side. Just adding the yeah, and uh, uh, this different from the web context? It's uh, yeah, web codex is one solution. It's how, how do you plug web codex into a different connection? Right, but I think haven't we already talked about that? So, this sounds, this sounds like a subset of an existing, I was wondering if they're the same or separate. It's specific to you, so that's one thing. Uh, yeah. uh, it's specific to you, and the current platform is to understand the different from allows you to do a workaround. That's why so it's you know what it is, but in terms of solution or uh, issues to it. Technical issues we want to solve, and I guess it's yeah, for the next thing. So, should we rename this issue to the flaggable audio product? Uh, 
I couldn't couldn't really hear that very well. Are you saying uh, is I guess one big question is, does this issue need to be uh, addressed for this use case, this low latency, or does it go somewhere else? Or it's I it's come up. In, yeah. My impression is that it's not linked to low latency specifically to low, low latency use case. We have a requirement for for uh, pluggable only products, but uh, it's not clear that it's specific to this use case. I could see like uh, recording, like you want to upload the like, recording scenario and you want to use your own product for whatever reason. So I agree with we are aware. It's uh it's sort of a different use case and uh, cloud gaming is, some, is somehow behind this use case, but uh We here focus on uh, putting more and then we look at the requirements that would be needed to fulfill uh, the products. It's also not clear to me whether we are talking about non standard products or whether we are talking about standard products that are not supporting the platform. From the platform standpoint, there's no difference between those two. Uh, yeah. I I uh, this is Peter. I raised my hand. I don't know if it's seen. We see it. Yeah. Sorry about sorry about not seeing everything. I'll take that one. I just wanted to say, I think I agree with what Harold was saying that the desire to use a, a codec, a different audio codec, perhaps even a custom one, a proprietary one, a machine, like, machine learning based one is a very common desire across many use cases. So it's not streaming specific. Is there a u existing use case, or do we need a new one for that? I don't know, but if we don't have one, we should. That's really because you, you can use data channel for things for you and decode yourself in your own decoders as well. So there, we are talking about one of your that is tied to a sender and not the sender. You need to justify that. And we need to justify that using the data channel like Zoom is using is not good enough. I think that there are lots of reasons why the data channel is not good enough for doing audio. For example, the congestion control or the existence of lots of RTP endpoints that you want to be able to be compatible with. If it's uh, non standard products, uh, it's uh, existing the RTP endpoints, uh, somehow competing. Uh, the, the big uh, elephant in there is called AAC, which is a standard folder, but it's uh, not supported by browsers because of the tablet patterns I've got. It. So with that, uh, more on, on, the, on, on this section, but uh, I think we have uh, two action items there. One is to detach issue 80 from uh, the low latency use case. And the other one is to, to create a new use case that is specifically for pluggable audio products which needs to specify what the, what the required behavior is down the line. 
what we need and why we need it. So Bernard, I think you can take on the uh, sketching of the, the, the use case for private uh, products. Yeah, um, we can we can do that in a separate use case, I guess. Um, so just uh, actually, it would be useful to put that resolution in issue eighty. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next slide. Sorry, just sorry. Before we move on, uh, is that just an audio thing, or should that also encompass video? Um, for the it it is just audio for as it related to the comment on the on the uh, streaming use cases. Um, although, um, yeah, I mean, assuming, for example, that, uh, I mean, HEBC is quite popular in streaming, but assuming that uh, eventually gets added to WebRTC, I think that would have been the major thing that people would have tried to do a new, try to do a, a custom codec for, but uh, that was about it. There a lot of uh, the the main things for audio with the spatial audio and then also AAC for the low latency streaming is pretty popular. Anyway, uh, but but in the other use case we might do it might also be video, but we can talk more about that. So one difference between audio and video is that uh, and with audio we need to continue on the debate on whether we. Whether well, we should have breakout box for audio or whatever, then we should depend on web, web, web audio. And uh, in the video case, we, well, breakout box is the existing interface to the raw video. So, okay. So, the complexity. You are coding and decoding is different from uh, video and coding and decoding in terms of complexity. It's very in terms of uh, feasibility of the use case, it seems, uh, it seems easier with video uh, than with video. I, I actually found, a, found a, an article about someone who implemented Lyra in Lyra Standard. Lyra is a very low bandwidth video product, folio product, mm -hmm. and plugged uh, it in by, by hacking the SDP for and telling for L16. And, and tricking the things that we got. Uh, it was the uh, audio packets were three bytes, but the overhead, uh, the RPP overhead was still, uh, still like eight bytes. <laughs> okay, so this is issue 103. This was some feedback from the UN, so we want to talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, one of the questions here was the term low latency appeared somewhat vague. We're going to have a discuss a little PR to hopefully clarify this. So next slide. Okay. So, uh, it, well, uh, so here's um, basically uh, we have uh, uh, N37, which relates to performance, and it's not all very specific. It's just talking basically mostly about video performance. So potential ways to address this would be either to leave it alone um, or to add, replace it with more specific performance requirements. We have a PR 118 um, along those lines where there's more discussion um, and we'll, I think, get into it when we talk about that PR. Um, the comment on N38 was the requirement, uh, re was relating to differ bucket target and it is correct that that requirement is partially satisfied by that. Um, as I, we mentioned earlier, we're not going to necessarily link to the APIs. Um, if that helps, I guess we could do it to say, hey, that we think that Jitter Butter is the solution to N38, um, but uh, recommending no action to do that at the moment. Any comments on this? Let me put it this way. Are there objections to the recommendation of no action on uh, to link N38 to Jitter buffer target. So, uh, given the discussion on what links to what so earlier, right? The action for N38 would, would seem to be to write an explainer saying that uh, Jitter buffer target satisfied and satisfies N38. 
and we can have right. this two options. Right. So that would that would go in the other document rather than in this document, right? Okay. So if we could put that down as a resolution to to I guess it would be whether to see extensions uh, to add a note there rather than here. Um, and then we can go on to discuss the specific performance requirements in PR 118, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. Okay, next. All right, so uh, do we have a presenter for PR 118? Oh, uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah, this is Sun. Uh, this is about clarifying the low latency game streaming requirement. Uh, as I presented last uh, meeting, the uh, basic rationale for the cloud gaming is we, we the cloud gaming is more require continuous visual feedback uh, to the user input, which means uh, this application require more uh, lower latency based uh, visual input. Also, uh, the cloud gaming requires uh, defining low latency KPI from uh, click to pixel latency, which is uh, a little bit different from uh, glass to glass latency as in other application. Also, the cloud gaming requires uh, a latency uh, lower than 150, which is uh, more preferable uh, by our uh, observation from uh, a lot of gamers out there. Also, the cloud gaming requires uh, a rather faster recovery than uh, video freezing. This is uh, also re uh, related with the uh, continuous uh, video uh, visual feedback. Uh, so also uh, for the latency perspective, it's mo much more important to have a, a continuous uh, rate, consistent uh, latency than uh, fluctuations, which is uh, also based on our observation or uh, expectation from the gaming perspective. So to combine everything, we want to have a, a ultra low latency with a faster recovery uh, to provide a better uh, cloud gaming experiences. So uh, next slide, please. So we define uh, four requirement uh, from N48 uh, to N51, we have added uh, this full requirement uh, and I uh, this has a little bit more details in the description part. So uh, first N48 uh, for recovering using the known uh, key frames, which is uh, based on uh, we already filed the uh, issue on WebRTC uh, uh, project. So this is uh, this by having this issue uh, resolved, we can support uh, a video decoding recovery using uh, the frame containing in infra coded macro block or coding units. So it is the basic uh, issue we filed uh, for having more clear, more accurate uh, frames information from sender to receiver. By having this uh, implementation, we can provide more uh, faster recovery by using the donkey frames. I think we can discuss uh, the issue after uh, explaining all the items. So and 49, on 49 is about uh, uh, loss of decoder, encoder synchronous notification. So we, uh, based on this information, we may need to have IPSI, reference frame uh, selection indication. I think uh, this can be discussed further 
in the next slide, but it has been uh, implemented by the web uh, inside of the WebRTC, but uh, it got deleted around uh, March 2017. So we may need to have this implementation for having this feature, but we can discuss further in next slide. And regarding the N50 configurable RTCP transmission interval, right now we have WebRTC send neck delay millisecond as a field trial, but we also want to have uh, set the transmission interval for transport wide RTCP. That is our uh, expectation to implement this feature. Uh, lastly, uh, M51 is to improve the uh, zero buffer control. I think it might be related with the previous uh, requirement as N38, but it is more, much more, uh, a little bit more details uh, about controlling the zero buffer. Uh, we may need to consider the render pipeline. I, I, I. I find uh, we found on, uh, one Chromium issue about uh, low latency render mode, uh, which is uh, uh, referenced in this uh, slide. So I think that's uh, those four uh, new requirement might have to implement uh, improve the current uh, current experience of the game streaming. Okay, uh, go to the next slide. So, and, uh, as I said, uh, M48 and uh, M49, uh, we may need a uh, uh, IPSI. Uh, I think this uh, slide edited by uh, Bonard. Bonard you wanna yeah uh, yeah sure cool. basically uh the uh rfc 8834 already recommends rpsi so essentially uh this is an uh, the itf already has this requirement for the stack so uh the issue is not whether rpsi uh, should be implemented this uh, 8834 already says that but the, there's some practical issues which are on the next slide so next slide. Yeah, so um, we have this document which is in call for adop adoption in ITFAB core relating to HEVC in WebRTC. Uh, and in issue 13 was filed relating to RPSI support because HEVC does support, uh, RFC 7798 does include support for RPSI. Um, and so uh, a little bit of, there's been a debate on that on that issue. Um, and as you said, it was originally in web in live web RTC, but it was removed in 2017. It, it was implemented for VP8 and VP9. Um, and uh, has was was taken out there. Um, and currently live web RTC doesn't support RPSI because that code was removed. Um, and also there was there was some effort previously to try out LTR. Um, and they've done a Instead of RPSI, they did a custom RTCP message. So the the bottom line is that there's nothing. The ITF recommends RPSI, uh, but there've been some practical difficulties in live web RTC. Um, so, uh, but there's an open issue if we can figure out a way of addressing this uh, within the code base in a way that can be implemented. Um, there's no, there's no, there's no. Uh, let me put it this way: the the W3C requirements are not an obstacle. <laughs> And the ITF recommendation, standards are not an obstacle here. It's just figuring out how to do this in a practical way within the, within the code base. Uh, so I'm not sure that we need a requirement for it, given that the ITF already uh, recommends it. Okay. Um, so, um, would there be a case where uh, an would like to enable or disable an RPS site? Or should it be uh, left to the user agent to decide what to do? OK. 
Okay, the question uh, I, I understood was um, should the application control the IPSI or the user agent should uh, control the IPSI? Is it correct? Yeah, that's a question, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, I think we can uh, set the application uh, based on our uh, proposal. We want application can control the IPSI. Well, uh, you at least with SDP munging, right? You can always say you can always negotiate it or not, like any other feedback. So that's. You know, that would be the way you would do it, assuming it was even in the live over to see. Well, we dislike it a dependent uh, right? Oh, can you repeat? Uh, I, I couldn't hear clearly. Bruno, you were saying that uh, when you for instance, you might need to use the SDP metric. That's the case when we, we tend to prefer excluding APIs and uh, rely on SDP managing for that. So if, I, I'm still not sure whether we want web applications to take control of that. But if, uh, if that's the case, then uh, having no requirement makes sense to me. If we think that the user agent is just the user agent that needs to implement it, then uh, we don't have anything to, to say in the WGC and it's just uh, five impacts on the implementations. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't really make that out because the audio is not great. But uh, I uh, think what I heard was, uh, if indeed there is a need for app control, then that should be an explicit requirement in the use case so that we can then see how to expose it in the API. Yeah, usually, um, I, I, I don't recall ever seeing a stack that had RPSI under app control. I mean, it's typically the, typically, uh, the, the, uh, the RTP stack just does it. And I think that's how it was originally was originally implemented for VP8 and VP9, but um, anyway, I, I, the suggestion here is to deal with this as an ITF problem uh, rather than a W3C one, and see if we can uh, figure out how to how to support our PSI in in Live Web RTC. Uh, well, uh, I think it's. Uh, and um, yeah, so apologies that my memories on this uh, topic are about four and a half years old, but I believe that uh, we will at some point want to uh, have certain APIs that would allow us to select uh, the reference frame, and we would uh, want to allow an application to actually directly control that, right? To inject the controller or to uh, basically do the controlling on a frame by frame basis. Uh, so apologies that the memory is not uh, sharp enough about all of the details, but basically uh, just wanted to bring this up. That's uh, very good. And uh, by the way, uh, in response to your question, uh, it is something that we would want to uh, turn on and off potentially, or at least to switch between different modes of uh, selecting the next frame. Uh, not the next frame, sorry, the frames for which we predict. Um, that's all. So some of the links that led to a Google decision to switch from using RPSI to using uh, loss notifications. Do you remember what was the which, which is not standard, which then takes back to idea. Do you remember what functionality in loss notification that was not tested in RPSI? Um, not the data, no, sorry, I don't remember RPSI. Um, I would have to look into it first. But uh, I remember the plus notification allowed us to know both uh, which frame, I'm sorry, which packet arrived last and also which one was the last one decoded in case there was uh, a frame that was over multiple uh, packets. But my memory here is very vague. So that's 
the might be that so we need more information than than now it's like again which can, again takes takes a matter back to back, back to ideas if it if it needs to go essentially. So action item seems to be to that we need to investigate what, what information needs to be passed both over the wire and uh, between the application and the spec. And uh, I figure out if there's idea work or API work or both or not to satisfy this requirement. Yep. So who's, who's action item is it? You? Well, uh, the the discussion of RPSI itself uh, in this will probably occur in ABT core, uh, and also maybe that includes discussion of this custom RTCP message since that seemed to work better than RPSI. Um, so the protocol side, I think, is handled in ITF, but I don't. But I think the question is who's. Uh, tying it together and figure out whether or not there is an API surface need. Uh, I think that should will come out of the. Uh, it, this is part of the HEBC uh, implementation in LiveWeb RTC, so I think that will uh, that will bubble up from from the discussion of the implementation. There's uh, PRs for both Safari and Chromium. Lots of PRs. Lots of PRs, right. More than one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I have uh, uh, two more uh, requirements. Uh, can you go, in, uh, go back to slide 35? Let's see, 35. Yeah. We're, we're also over time on this segment now. So yeah. Uh, yes, there there are uh, N fifty and N fifty one. Uh, regarding the N fifty, I think we already have neck delay, but we still need a transfer wide RTCP in Tupper. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for the transport point, if you negotiate the V2 of that, the sender has explicit. There's a flag basically per packet saying that the sender wants feedback from the recipient of this packet. So that you have very high and great control over packet feedback. Uh, so, uh, uh, does it does that mean uh, we have a uh, implementation already? Uh, the receive side implementation is there. That I'm very sure. Uh, it used to be used by Stadia, but, uh, but the sell side I'm not sure about if it's implemented in the open source version. Okay. If it's not, it should be in my book. Right? Can you type on our solution? I think I think we're approaching overtime, so uh, maybe we need to finish this in the overflow session. Okay. So we've got the uh, so we, we'll, we'll take care of uh, slides uh, thirty eight to thirty eight to forty three. We'll go to the overflow session. And by that, we'll switch to the application for low latency fans. Hi, everyone. I'm Balak. And yeah, I'm going to talk about the low latency fan of use case, which is 3.12. And 
basically all of those issues in PR that we already have on GitHub and to support this mistakes. Uh, so we already had this setup discussed in the last meeting in July, but let me go through that again. So we have a node here or, or receiving peer, which has two receiving peer connections, or delivering encoded frames from the same original capture stream, but with different metadata because of data use. And what we'll do here is we'll use encoded transforms to read the encoded frames from these two peer connections. And you set metadata on the frame such that the two encoded frames with the same data with the same payload uh, get the same metadata after. Uh, and this modified frame can now be forwarded to other video PCs and also rendered on this node's local element using structure flow. Next slide. And to support this use case, we have the following three requirements. Or we want to, or we would like to change the WebRTC English frame spec uh, with the following three changes. First is the ability to move frames between peer connections. The second would be to call structured clone on frames, encoded frames. And the third would be to allow modifying the RTC encoded video or uh, RTC encoded frame metadata for both audio and video. Uh, regarding the first one, that would allow us to that would allow a node to receive encoded frame from one peer connection and write it to another. And to achieve this change, we would uh, we would uh, we would need to remove the restriction clause on streams being limited to only one peer connection. And we already have a PR for that. And also the two issues that I mentioned here. And yeah. We haven't seen much activity there yet, so yeah, maybe discussions today might help. Uh, next slide. Uh, the second would be to allow structured clone on encoded frames so that the receiving peer can use the same encoded frame for rendering locally and also for forwarding to other reading peers. And this, for this, we would uh, want to mark the RD single frame serializable. And we also have a PR initial for this one. Next. And the last one is to modify the metadata for the RDC single frames so that the frames from different peaks. Uh, so to support the redundancy use case in case of peer failure. And we want to limit our changes only to RTP timestamp for audio and video. And for video, we only want to, in addition to this, we also want to do frame IDs and dependencies change. And we also have a PI news case for uh, PI news case for this. Yes. Yeah. So I think most the discussions on the PI and the issues. Yeah. Yeah. The one with the minor point is that the formal requirements on the mark or something is serializable. A platform object is serializable. Not that they have a Serialization and a deserialization step defined. But uh, serialization and deserialization does not require that the output be observable by JavaScript. So the steps can just say and do an internal package an internal format and the actual internal format. So this doesn't need to be a have we had this definition? That's a minor. I'm responsible for that particular PR, so I have not inserted those sentences yet. Sorry about that. I think you did have one comments. Had it come up? Did we have that? I have a few questions. Uh, first, one clarification. You're talking about encoded frames, right? Yes. So the second question would be, if we had a constructor for encoded frame, would that be sufficient for some of these things? Would that obviate the need for some of these, or is that just unrelated? We have a discussion on constructor. 
but uh, we in this particular use case we found that defining the constructor required defining all the metadata and while uh, just modifying metadata allowed us to say that and by the way there's there's more metadata on this frame but we don't but we don't look at it and we don't change it so so, so when uh, looking at the WebRTC internal implementation, which is messier than it has to get. And this was a significant simplification, which is why we were suggesting clone instead of uh, constructor. We do need constructor for other use cases. I mean, we dropped discussing the one ended use cases for this meeting, but so they're coming back. So okay, so my. my My final question was about the, the forwarding of the encoded frames to another peer connection. When you do that, how do you know what bandwidth is available for forwarding to the other uh, peer connection to know what you're capable of forwarding and not? So the use case where we were yeah, highlighting this, it's uh, a use case where we know that the ones we are forwarding to are on the same local network. And we are assuming that so these have at least a gigabit of uh, LAN fields available. Uh, the detection of which are on the local network and which are not is uh, an interesting problem, but uh, not something that is resolved in the way I see. I think. Uh, I think whether you're forwarding a frame or just sending a frame is. Uh, the question if you have enough bandwidth is unrelated to the fact that you're forwarding a frame. It's just a peer connection and you're sending a frame. So that can be asked of any peer connection. So we have the Aniva on the cube and we have <laughs> Yeah, so, so I just have a little bit of a concern about how we got here because what about you see encoded frame to paraphrase is basically uh, taking a pipe out of the wall, breaking it in half and inserting JavaScript to give JavaScript uh, a means to transform existing frames, um, which led to some of the limitations we're fighting here. But that also becomes a, it seems that that has become a, a very powerful opportunity for JavaScript to say, hey, what happens if I put all this other stuff in? And I'm a little concerned with moving frames between PCs. What does that do to the <clears throat> user agent's ability to know what's going on and to be able to uh, make optimal decisions? So I'm questioning whether this is the right. So I'm not necessarily opposed to solving these problems, but I'm questioning a bit if this is the right API surface, uh, if we need a better surface, if the goal is going to be to um, give more uh, broader uh, controls to JavaScript here. Uh, as far as structured clone, I don't see a problem. Uh, well, I should ask, encoded, this is encoded frames, right? So there's no GPU backing, is that right? No GPU encoding. Right, so, so since there's no specific ownership transfer issues, I don't see a problem with structured clone. Although I would have seen a problem with it perhaps on raw frames, but uh, ability to modify metadata, same thing. Um, it seems like this at least was designed for one thing and now it's being repurposed. So there might be an opportunity to revisit API surface. Is that fair? Yeah. So uh, now we have UI. So uh, I have similar concerns in terms of the use case. Uh, with WebRTC encoding transform, we saw that if you're adding too much metadata, then things are blowing up. And there, basically, uh, it's the same case that might happen because there might be a gigabyte connections, but actually there might be packet loss. So bandwidth estimation is much lower, and you will still try to push to put a lot of data. So we are, we are getting into the case where uh, the user agent expects 
to send that amount of data and actually if we try the JavaScript will try to uh, send a much bigger uh, or much lower. If it's too low, then maybe uh, it's, the bandwidth information will never map up either. And the user agent is responsible to say encoder the bitrate is you, you should achieve that and now you should achieve that and so on. And that's the model we were looking at transform. And with this we we are uh, moving away from that. But we are still using the web of the transform. And uh, I think it would be preferable to, to have a different API shape where we're saying uh, there's no end of work. Because I'm aware of the JavaScript is responsible for the end of And then it's very clear from the user agent that uh, it has to do something else in terms of uh, value validation and so on. Like, uh, so that's the first one. And practically speaking, I don't understand if you have packet loss, I don't understand how you get the notification uh, on the static site. Like the application is uh, is getting a frame and sending it. And if the send is not successful, then it should receive a notification that the packet was lost. And it should trigger on the other side that there's a new key frame that should be sent and so on. And we don't have these mechanisms there. So in, in that particular use case, you need to be in a very good uh, network like Ethernet, no packet loss. And uh, I don't see how web applications can know that. Web applications cannot know whether they are on Ethernet uh, one gigabyte uh, connections. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what the label that actually is. Um, so I would much prefer that we have an API. Uh, web application is responsible of the encoding. And when some say, it receives a notification that says there's a play that arrives or fear. And, it will react upon it. And where the CNP transform is not the one that And if they want to respond to that? Yes, and again, I suspect that forwarding key frame requests is already solved on paper, perhaps not implemented. But uh, Philip Hanke added to the set parameters API the key frame request. And I believe whether or not you receive key frame requests is visible in get that. So you could just Against that, and then yeah. Yeah. so you have a lot of latency, and you basically you won't get the, the fear packet, and you won't receive it as soon as possible in a, in a worker thread to be able to send as soon as possible to the other guy as a as another person the packet. We we don't have that. So yeah, you will be able to get the stats. It will take one second to actually process it, send it to the other guy that will call uh, set parameters to be frame and so on. So it will take you like maybe one or two seconds to, to get the key frame. That's very really simple. So we're going to allow this on the key. Sorry, I thought this was. What, so the important thing seen from with the eyes of, of the recommendation team and that has been done in this is that we know that this can be done because we've done it. And, uh, Yes, there are alternatives in terms of API shape. And I will try to pursue a few of them in my time. But uh, we aren't ready yet. We don't care if it works because we haven't done it. So we'd like to have those part these particular models done because we think that. A, they work, and B, they will be part of any solution, anyway. And you said that they were working in the lab. For the, for, the, for the use case that we have this. Yes. Whether uh, those are that or yeah. other things. Uh, by the way, they did find a couple of instances of exactly the problems that you were outlining and uh, they were fixed. I think that this is already working with existing API to a very high degree. Uh, means that, for example, if, if there's an issue with 
it takes a second to help with the question. Keep paying the quest. It might be easier if you just add an event for that rather than go out to the, the, the backwater and, and have us complete a separate API. It's just fixable. Uh, it's still better. Uh, in the current proposal, it means that we need that and we need a lot of more APIs. And I think that it would be better to say, okay, we need, at the end of the day, we need more APIs. And uh, in terms of API shape, uh, this way, what's the end that it's not from the right place to feel, to, to, is it the right place for, for all the APIs? And, uh, would we there be another API that would, that would be better? And my understanding is that uh, given that there's no encoder anymore, it will be better to have a different API. So uh, I think that whoever is seeing Google Transform is the right document. The particular constructor that uh, is currently on the spec for setting up a transform seems to point at the a, a, a ma manner of usage that is not quite what we are trying to do here. But uh, that's... Uh, I'd like to do this iteratively and not uh, wait for the perfect, perfect solution to arrive. Well, I understand the iterative way. And, uh... The spec is called the RTM and transform. If this is clearly not a transform, you're not transforming. You're sending something. Yeah. And uh, if you if you want to argue that we should break up the the web of saying called the transform spec so that the so that the backers are in another spec, that's a rational argument. I mean um I'd like to understand why we are not trying to look at a new API shape. Um, yep. Yeah. And the, the answer so far has been because the yeah. because the new API shape discussions have been inconclusive, and we found that uh, modifications of the existing API are both implementation wise and tech wise, amenable to iterative work. So, I made a, I made a proposal for a, for a new API shape for, for this particular model. So, one and a half years ago, and then style for that for feedback. I don't remember, uh, but I, I, I would be happy to, to look at that. Because maybe this is the thing we should revive. Uh, one year and a half ago, uh, there were all sorts of other things that were maybe more important. And now we are we're in a position where we see that the recent credit transform has some issues, like, for instance, with the middle like that thing. And uh, we don't have a solution for that. So I, I would look at that. I would look at this case and they are very similar and I'd like to, to get the, the solution. And um, maybe your document your whole document is exactly what what, what will be there. So um, yeah, if you can send it either to me or my list or um, great. I think we are out of time. And what the next one they end up together is in fact that. Yep, back at 1400, it'd be nice if everyone is timely so we can get started right away. See you in an hour. Thank you.
Okay, we're back again. Hope everyone had a good lunch. And that some of the chips see the book. Anyway, subject line for, for, the, for this set, section, 40 or minutes. Or you need a try. Let me see. Dom, are you still there? I can, I can try to describe. Okay, you and is trying to describe. Thank you. Subject matter, web legacy and media capture. You have 40 minutes, 35 minutes from now. Thank you. Uh, next, I think we have the next slide. So the obvious and uh, next slide, I'll start with the track stats API today. Uh, so the track stats API has, uh, we've added it to the extension spec previously to count uh, the train counters, how many trains are produced, delivered, discarded, or dropped. And we've come up with the definitions for these uh, stats, but there's been an ongoing discussion whether the the metrics should be exposed with an asynchronous API or a synchronous API. Uh, and so the, the issue is that the train counters live on uh, off the main thread because media is flowing uh, off the main thread. And we have these uh, run to completion uh, semantics uh, design principle that says that you should not change values exposed to JavaScript um, in the same task execution cycle. Uh, to avoid races. Uh, so, for example, you could post, uh, post a task to change the value. And I previously argued against a synchronous API uh, because I was afraid of the excessive post tasking or having to use new fixes uh, or, or caching. Um, but as, as have been proven in the thread, and also now I have implementation experience, uh, we can. Uh, we can implement it either way, um, and and we can do so with, with that metrics in our post stats. Uh, anyway, so next slide. So basically, <laughs> it should be a track of stats or some other version or a weight. And because uh, the site used this in an async, uh, be able to use this in a context that is not async. I decided to do so has been expressed, and I've seen that uh, implementing this is trivial. So now I have a PR that changes the API from an await API to getters. And the way you can uh, achieve the, the design principles is that you have internal slots, and then you only update them uh, if you haven't already updated them in the class execution cycle. I'm I'm happy to like follow up and should decide should they live in the separate interface or should we move them into the track. Um, so, so that's up for discussion. But what I want to to get consensus on today is whether it should be asynchronous or synchronous. So I have a PR that changes this, and my proposal is that we merge merge it. Comments. Um, yeah, I don't want to. and I don't want to uh, react things that uh, with the synchronous API. There, we're giving the impression that you can do real time stuff based on the stats. So, at least we have video stats, and if you have the name video stats, you might think no, it's not real time. So that's uh, that's that's a good thing. Um, I still don't like that we have to do extra work somehow to, by default, to implement this API. I would prefer that somehow you would only start counting or start doing some stuff if there's a, a call, and there it's not, not really the case because it's a, it's a, it's a getter. In, in the implement, and I, I implemented both versions of this API. Mm -hmm. And I was, so the counters, they live on, on one thread and you just plus equals one, right? It's simple. The only work you have to do is when you get them 
and it's possible to do without uh, new texts. So yeah, I would argue that the synchronous version ended up being simpler because, uh, well, for yeah. the frame stats, you can just use the uh, atomics. So you still need to, at the end of the task, to clear the slot, right? Or no, you, okay, you, you, you can enter somehow. Of... So you can do it. You just need to keep track of if you've already updated them. Like if the getter has already been called in the current task execution cycle, you don't need to do anything in between. So the naive implementation would be to have a Boolean that says uh, catch equals false. And then if cat is false, you update the values, set the value to true, and then you queue a micro task to set cat also uh, again. Micro task. Yeah. So you can do it without a mat. So the uh, micro task, if you just keep an uh, ID to the you know, which task execution cycle am I in? One, two, three, four, five. And just remember, last time I updated the counter was in task execution 10. So it's 11 now, I'll update it. That avoids the post task, but again, I mean, one post task for the call list also. We don't have this ID, but yeah, that's, that's fine. But um, you, you cannot do a micro task because then if you enter your micro task after that, there will be another micro task. But, so you would need to, to uh, execute the flushing at the end of the, of the last micro task, and that's not. Well, you need to build machinery there for that. Um, yeah, I, I still think that we are, we are trying to make more people, more web developers trying to do real-time uh, uh, processing in the main thread with this kind of API. And uh, we should reserve that to uh, when they're in a worker, so when there's a video track processor or when it's within another worker. Right, might make sense to write it as well. But uh, yes, uh, so that's fine. Yep. Oh. So uh, this is re-implementing stable state, essentially. The stable state concept, right? Can we not use that? What's the stable state? state? What you're describing is called waiting a stable state in the HTML spec, like it's a well-defined concept, right? So you can say these attributes are updated when, when, the, when there is a stable state, meaning there is no JavaScript on the stack anymore. So the attribute values can be updated and next time you run some code there, they have a new value. That's, that's something that's used a lot. Uh, so yeah, run to completion is preserved, that's the main purpose. Uh, but also it's efficient, so that counts. Yeah, so we use that, for example, in media element. Uh, we use that, I don't know, a bunch of locations in where we are. But the exception would be timers, like APIs, where if you, you query, you get a different value each time, but uh, all that, yeah. If I remember the concept of stable state correctly, which I may not, that's uh, what is happening between cycles, between execution cycles. So, so, so you're saying that you, you could conceptually update the counters whenever you hit the state, stable state. Yes. So, so that uh, implementation wise, you would want to do it with cash because, because uh, you don't want to impose any overhead when you don't read it. Yeah. So it's, the difference is not that observable, so it doesn't matter what aspect is. And the way the language is right now is it says, if this is the first time the getter is called in this task execution cycle, if that needs to be rephrased, uh, then we can rephrase it, but the, the concept is the same. You, you call the getter, but I mean, just return it. So in spec, we need to define behavior on that implementation detail, right? So that's also fine. It's the same. You can implement it the way you want, as long as it's the same. Uh, 
So yeah, I mean, we would implement it with stable state or I don't know, triple buffer or whatever. But yeah, it needs to be this. This is clear, and we can implement it the way we want. I think. Uh, but yeah, you can also you, you can also describe it exactly in the same way. Uh, using the saying that the value is only updated during stable state, right? This is this is equivalent in terms of observable behavior, and it's using the concepts that are already used in the web platform. But then you do what you want. Either you update always, or you pull the update in your cache. Then you decide depending on how the implementation works, what is best. Um, but yeah. It's just that if we have a concept that fits uh, use, then we should just reuse it. Again, yeah. I can pull out examples. Maybe it's going to be clear. Like bits of other specs that do exactly the same thing and see how they write it. But yeah. Sometimes I, I modify this pull request or I do a follow up pull request. Borrows existing language to make it more clear. Yeah, I can. But are there any any objections to me you know, going in this direction? Merge and iterate, or modify and merge. Sounds like everyone's fine with making a synchronous. So you only have this context. pushing for synchronous. I don't need to change with my. The. Uh, yes, so yes, I'm supportive of synchronous API and merging this PR. I just had an unrelated comment that uh, on the slide, you're juxtaposing get stats versus video stats. Uh, so there's a separate issue of naming there. I mean, a track is always either video. It's always either video track or an audio track. So we could probably simplify and just call it stats and have it be a union of two interfaces uh, uh, or one or the other. But but that's but yes for this particular issue, I, I think sync works, and thank you, Henry, for doing the implementation uh, design. Can I merge and file a follow up issue for uh, name and uh, the phrasing? So basically merge this because because I also have code that does this. Yeah, I'd, I'd support that. Okay. So the resolution two follow ups would be. Uh, adjust the language if we find a way to express the same concept sim in a way that is simpler and more in line with the rest, and, and also rename so that it's called stats. Yes. So it would be, let's say, audio.stats or video.stats. Fine by me. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, this is me. So, uh, hi, I'm Yanni Barr from uh, Mozilla. And so, I um, just wanted to take this opportunity to present something Firefox has implemented recently, which is a select audio output, which is part of the media capture output spec. And um, just a quick refresher on this API is that uh, even though uh, the ability to, to change the uh, default output path uh, say you're in a library, for example, is, is behind permission. Uh, you get it automatically if you get permission to microphone. But then there are use cases outside of video conferencing where you might be able to, where you might want to not necessarily ask the user for permission to their microphone just to be able to redirect output to a speaker. So that's what the select audio output API does. It has its own prompt in order to uh, reduce fingerprinting risk because of the old uh, numerate devices approach turned into be a, a big uh, fingerprinting vector. <clears throat> anyway, so we have that implemented. Um, and here's a demo page you can try. It has a play button and a select speakers button. The idea is that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the user can click select, they can just hit play and have it, uh, play audio out at the default audio path. Or they can, um, sorry, can we go back a slide? Yes. So um, you can just hit play, or you can first 
click select speakers, pick a different uh, device like AirPods in the prompt, in the browser prompt. And then when you then hit play button, it'll play in your AirPods. Uh, and Firefox will per persist these device IDs so that you can refresh the page or come there later. And when you hit play, it would automatically go to your AirPods if they're available. But there's a problem. Uh, if you refresh, the next time you, you enter the page, if the AirPods are in their case and you hit play, you get a prompt. And this is uh, confusing users because users expect it to see a prompt when they hit select speakers, not when they hit the play button. And in that case, perhaps the better option would be to just play out through the normal audio path. Next slide. So the, the thinking here is that this behavior, whether it should play out through the default audio path in that case, or if there should be a prompt, <clears throat> is that, should be up, that should be an application decision. <clears throat> um, but the way this API was designed is that you're always supposed to call select audio output at the risk of a prompt uh, in order to deter trackers before you use a device ID that you've stored. Um, so here's a proposal to modify this behavior slightly um, to give applications uh, an opportunity to avoid the prompt. <clears throat> uh, so the proposal is if the user agent recognizes a device ID having been removed, meaning it was a device ID it used to satisfy earlier, then it is allowed to reject select audio output where you pass in a device ID with a not found error as a one-time courtesy instead of prompting. Uh, subsequent calls, uh, it says would continue to prompt, could continue to prompt. It might be up to a bit to user agents since this is a fingerprinting mitigation, uh, exactly how that would work. But this would provide an app, applications an opportunity to remove this device ID from their local storage. And this would still serve as a deterrent to trackers. And this should be possible to implement by tracking recently removed devices. So that's the proposals. Uh, any uh, comments or feedback? Um, this is when, in the use case uh, that you mentioned, uh, I was wondering when, when you refresh, when um, device devices not showing the uh, device output, <clears throat> that you're still pretending to know that it's there. So, in terms of design, I wonder whether that's, that's good. And uh, more generally, I was thinking. If, if the issue is that you have your airport, you refresh, and you there you want to not prompt. So maybe you could say that enable devices can expose the device I put a little bit longer. So refresh after refresh, maybe for five, 10 minutes. And if so, then uh, the web page of this refresh, it would call the enable devices, check whether the device is there. If it's not there, it knows that uh, there will be a prompt basically. <laughs> And uh, maybe that's a different solution um, to, your, to, to your problem without changing the algorithm. Right. So uh, the, the fact that you have a device ID stored doesn't, you know, uh, enumerate devices already is quite limited initially, right? So uh, there's a chicken and egg here where enumerate devices, uh, output devices, in the numerate device only appear in the numerate devices after you call select audio output. So I think the use case is you store your device ID that you used last time to local storage and you, you pass that into select audio output. So that's the first thing that happens. So there's no information in the numerate devices yet. And then there's, a, there's either a prompt or, or this new not found error. And then the application can respond and decide either to say, never mind, let me remove my device ID and play out through the default audio, or a call select audio output again without a device ID, which will cause a prompt. Did I miss something there? Well, I was wondering, wondering whether we could uh, change a little bit the uh, web page so that uh, uh, it would not always call select audio output. Uh, or, or it would call select audio output and the device ID there is just a hint for the user agent to show from and press select things or to, to do uh, like no prompt if it, if it can. Um, and if, 
it seems that when you have a refresh, what the web page wants to know is whether it can still uh, have the airport. And uh, for any more devices, if you have that for a limited time, then uh, the web page can uh, actually show airports knowing that it's there and available. And if it's not there, then it will say select devices or it will just say. Right. As I recall, though, the original design here was expressly to avoid the trackers being able to track this information, uh, which we, I mean, that's a similar fix we did to camera microphone is that even though you have camera microphone permission, doesn't mean that it's, uh, which, you know, since COVID happened, you know, most people probably have given permission to all kinds of sites. So the decision there was to, that it, it was still a fingerprinting surface that was unnecessary. So do we deferred exposure to till after uh, camera active camera microphone was actually in use. So yeah, I, mean, I think the same concern applies here, yeah? Uh, it, it's, it would be only for a limited amount of time. Like apparently for Firefox, if you click uh, grant access to the camera, then if you refer to the page, or you navigate to the page that access that you don't get the same origin, mm -hmm. you will see that information for a limited amount of time. And I was wondering whether the same approach that you were using there uh, for um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I quite follow the, the proposal there, but uh, if we agree that uh, this is something we should solve, then we could always iterate on the issue, perhaps. Uh, but I think our, our preference would still be to, um, to, to find a solution here uh, as simple as possible. Uh, that would not involve enumerated devices, I think, because I don't see why you don't run the risk of trackers in that case. Um, so, it would, so you want so not the enumerated device and not the on device change. So on device change, there's a question if if the user later inserts their AirPods, uh, it might be useful to fire the device change event in that case. But we could do that as a follow up. If the case if the case are iPods, then there's there's a device change event because because they put them away. But oh sure. If that fires before the page is reloaded, then the, the new the reloaded page will not get the correct change event. Right. The uh, same problem. So reloads complicates everything. Yes. I mean, uh, this uh, demo uses reload as the as the example, but in in practice, you know, you could be uh, coming back the next day to use the site again. So the question there is, um, how do we recognize? How do we give application a way to recognize the device if it's there? Um, and I guess we could we could like force some language to always fire the device, you know, an artificial device change event. Uh, if you had the AirPods end all the time, sort of to give the application early warning, hey, you still have this device. But all these approaches seem more complicated than just uh, failing. Yeah, I have a little worry about the one-time courtesy. I would actually, because if you if you then call select out all the output twice by accident, you you lose the information. Or, or if you reload twice and you you you, you haven't been able to uh, update your your uh, IDB, for instance. Mm. Uh, so I so I I wonder if we could simply do select all the output with device ID, and that is a known device, but it's no longer there. You return not found there. So well, I, case. Yes, I mean, instead of would, it could say should. We could leave this up to user agents since this is a mitigation issue uh, about how many times to reject, for example. Um, but at some point, you know, there, it's tricky to discern trackers from legitimate use cases, right? So I'd be happy with uh, some vague language here, as long as we have this allowance. Um, but I don't know if we need to go all the way and say it must fail with not not found error forever. 
should should be shared. Mm. It's not okay with me because also also because it allows uh, peasant behavior, which is backward compatible thing. Right. Yeah, we could do that. All right, okay. I'm, I'm I'm happy with this feedback. So, thank you. It's, it's you. All right, so this is over in WebRTC uh, uh, PC. Uh, we found out. Uh, so Firefox is implementing the, uh, the ice transport. Uh, well, the final parts of the ice transport, we had part of it, uh, but we're finishing that work. And so we noticed that there's a bit of a gap here that if you have a data channel only peer connection, it's actually not possible to locate the ice transport object early enough to observe early events like uh, ice gathering. And the reason for that is the transport on a transceiver, the transport, the DTLS, the ice transport lives off the DTLS transport, which lives off of either a transceiver or the SCTP object. Now, transceivers are exposed after set local description. Uh, and that's early enough to catch all the ice agent events. SCTP, however, is only, only becomes non-null uh, in stable state when you have the answer, when negotiation has completed which means that since you don't have the SATP object yet, there's no way to find the ice tra DTLS transport or the ice transport. <clears throat> it means you can't register event listeners early enough to catch state changes um, for the ice transport. Um, for DTLS, you probably can, can make do, but uh, yeah, for ice, uh, you want gathering state, select a candidate pair change perhaps if there's a peer reflexive candidate. So, this seems inconsistent. So the question is, should we surface to SATP's transport in set local description uh, like other transports? Um, one complication there is we would still have to handle rollback, but we already handled rollback for the other transports, so that doesn't seem that big of a deal. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> now the SATP object itself has a couple of attributes that uh, so it'd be a little, so exposing it early might cause um, some properties to be available sooner. And it turns out there's only one, it's max message size, uh, which currently is just a number. And it would have to become nullable just like max channels is today. So um, hopefully in most cases, applications are written where they know what state they're in and they're reacting to uh, existing events. And they use, that means you don't necessarily have to think about this, provided you're in a known state like connected, for example. <clears throat> but if you're writing code that instead uh, doesn't rely on state, but is sort of inferring state based on the presence or absence of the SCTP object, for example, you might run into trouble uh, because earlier uh, the sentence in red here would have worked. Uh, like if you have an SCTP object, you have a max message size. So you would have to modify that to also make sure that the max message size is not null before you have that uh, information. Um, so it's, you know, there's some proposals uh, on the issue to make more significant changes, but I think this late in the game, we need to minimize changes based on uh, compatibility concerns so the, the only two proposals I'm presenting here is basically to do this, to surface the SATP transport in, S, in set local description a little bit earlier, just like the other transports. The other proposal is to do nothing and then basically say that for data channel only uses, direct people to use the existing um, aggregate um, event listeners, like on ice candidate connection state change and on ice gathering state change arguing that in the data channel only transport case, uh, you only have one transport. Uh, but for consistency, I, I would prefer that we do A. So any objections, any any thoughts, any objections so got, to doing proposal uh, A? I got three people on the queue. Go ahead. Uh, Peter, Henrik, and Florence. Peter? I think you're right that we want to expose the ice transport earlier on, especially if we add controls as we're proposing uh, 
as we have been and have later slides about. So I don't think B really works well. And I think there might be a proposal C, which is to add a method like peer connection dot get ice transports. And that would give you direct access to ice transports. Um, and in the data channel case, you'd expect there would only be one. And that would be backwards compatible. But I would be fine. With, I would also be fine with A. Uh, I was wondering, is, is it useful to have this uh, transport earlier? And if so, why? Or is this only about the consistency? Uh, it's it's useful because otherwise there's no way to get at the ice transport and without the ice transport there the event handlers that are on the previous slide will not be accessible oh, okay. to you. I see. Yeah, that's um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure about having max message size notable. Um, since this is uh, mostly an implementation um, detail uh, on the user agent and uh, uh, it's going to be most likely a fixed value. That value can be updated later on negotiation, but that's something that you would need to handle in, in your code. So if a user agent returned a value that they currently support or intend to negotiate, that would probably be fine. And so we don't need to have code that can handle max message size being done. Uh, when you say implementation issue in the browser or in the application? Uh, the max message size is uh, something that is a property of the browser mm -hmm. and the implementation in the browser. So it's something it, sure. the browser is going to uh, use a specific value automatically and negotiate that, um, something you could possibly alter by merging SDP, but probably mm -hmm. something that most people will do. Um, so if you return that value, um, that would be fine. And then later on, after negotiation, mm -hmm. then you will have to see maybe the other side has a different implementation that has a smaller buffer size. So you need to handle that anyway. So being okay. able to see some value is probably not going to be a problem. Having null, on the other hand, means you need to handle that use case and it could be a problem So or existing implications. I don't think it's... Um... Okay. So are you proposing uh, A, but change max message size to not be, in, or, or leave mes max message size alone? And then you might, you might the value might change after negotiation? Uh, that's um, maybe orthogonal to A or B, but in, uh, yes. I think I would be uh, supportive mayor for A, where we would have to roll back the transport if it, we don't have a CTP negotiated in the end. And uh, that's more work, but I think that could be useful. But I didn't think much of, about it yet. Okay. All right, thanks. I'd like to support Peter's uh, option C. I mean, we, when we start trying to use transport to write tests for PTLS transport, we found that uh, all the tests had uh, useless code that uh, added data channels or added uh, audio tracks or seemed quite random uh, what kind of object we had, had to add. But, uh, uh, and quite independent of what we're, try we're trying to look at. So I, I would rather, if we need to observe the state of the transport before we know whether or not there's going to be an SATP transport on it, I mean, the section might get rejected. As I propose we add an, add an attribute to the peer connection that, uh, that attribute or getter that gets, gets the transports. Okay. The, the problem, though, is that during negotiation, there can temporarily be multiple transports. And then when yes. the answer comes back, and it, if it's bundle, a lot of those might go away again. So we have a lot of complexity built into the model here. So I'm a little nervous about exposing more 
um, methods because you'd have to return an array of transports then, and it's not clear which transport is which. Yes. So, so if you if you care about which transport is which, which then you then you need to need to actually compare them to the transports linked to the linked to the sanders. But in many cases, like if if you do max bundle, then you will only have one transport mm -hmm. ever. Right. So index index zero. So do you see proposal C as instead of proposal A then, or is that something that we could discuss separately? Uh, I, would do, I would do it instead of uh, A because, uh, because uh, if we have this, then the use case for surfacing an SATP, a boost as a SATP transport that might disappear hmm. before you can use it, disappears too. If we're only concerned about this one specific ICE transport, what about proposal B to have an attribute for the SNCP transports, ICE transport? Or does that be messy? Well, I, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about it becoming messy here because uh, our transport situation is a bit complicated. We do seem to have an inconsistency about when we expose transports. It would be nice to fix that. So, uh, you know, I, I would still uh support proposal a here i think given the options but um for the record i i like proposal a too okay all right um so uh, harold how do you feel about proposal a in isolation see much benefit from it. I see some benefit. It's slightly backwards and but incompatible. Uh, and it uh, bugs me a bit, but not so much to, that that okay. no. <laughs> okay. I would prefer, prefer C, but uh, I could live with A. Okay. Um so I think in most cases the max message size would not be an issue because hopefully applications uh, will already await the correct state before they go around. So whenever they do read it, they will not have to deal with null. But this is an initial state only that since we expose it early, you would only have this problem if, if for some reason are looking at the object early, which you wouldn't be if, if you act in known states. So that would be my, my case for it. But I think we're at time. And so I'm hearing, I'm hearing no main objections to proposal A, is that right? And then we can file an issue on if we want to have a, a separate method for transport, I get a, getting a, a transport array. But that does seem problematic to me in that you wouldn't know which one's which. I think that's my time. Okay. Okay, that thank you. We're four, only four minutes over time. So it's Samir. Yeah. So I will be. Sorry. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Samir, and uh, today Peter and I will continue our conversation about uh, the ICE controller API. So this is the roadmap that we started off with uh, for incremental improvements to ICE control on the web. The first item has a PR that's seen quite a lot of discussion, debate, and iterations. Uh, so it's quite uh, feels quite well done uh, at this stage. The next two items have open PRs that will I will uh, the, that I will talk about a bit more today, and then Peter will talk later about uh, some of the following items. So the next slide. So the goal of this item is to allow applications to choose any of the valid candidate pairs to send data. And uh, a few rules from RFC 8445 that are relevant in this particular situation. So to summarize them, ICE agents start off by collecting candidate pairs, uh, performing checks, and then at some point, the controlling agent decides to do nomination on one of those valid pairs. 
once the nomination succeeds, data can only be sent and received on the selected pair. And uh, the agent isn't allowed to nominate again. And an I3 start is required if we want to send data on a different candidate pair. And that's what we would like to avoid. We want to avoid an I3 start because that needs several more round trips of SDP exchange, candidate pair exchange, more connectivity checks, nomination, and all of that. So we are allowed to use any valid candidate pair prior to nomination. And so that's uh, what we are proposing. So on the next slide, we are a new event that is fired on the controlling ICE agent when it wants to do nomination. If the application chooses, it can prevent the nomination from happening by canceling this event by calling prevent default. And instead, the application can call a new method, set selected candidate pair, to choose how to send data to the uh, to the peer. And uh, once application calls set selected, the ICE agent will immediately start sending data on that candidate pair. So this is something that can be done both on the controlling and control side, because nomination is the only thing that uh, only the controlling uh, side uh, gets to do. So on the controlling side, uh, when the application calls set selected, we can have another nomination event fire, which uh, now the application can either let that uh, carry on and uh, conclude ICE, or it can prevent that nomination as well uh, if it wants to change the candidate pair at some point further in the future. So that's the API for that. Uh, and uh, just to clarify, this proposal does not alter in any in the, uh, the fundamental I states or state transitions in any way. So the only thing this will do is allow us to be in this uh, intermediate pre-conclusion state where we can use any candidate pair that we want. Uh, and then it still lets us get to the conclusion uh, as well. So the I state machine can still function uh, in compliance with RFC 8445. So on the next slide, So this item deals with uh, removing candidate pairs that are no longer necessary. So for this, we propose a new method, remove candidate pairs, uh, fairly straightforward. It can also do bulk removals for efficiency. And when a candidate pair is removed uh, using this new method, it triggers an, a non-cancellable uh, candidate pair remove event. And that makes it symmetric with the add event that was proposed in an earlier PR as well. So on the next slide. So this is an example that puts together all the new APIs proposed thus far. Uh, it's an application that only wants to use UDP candidate pair uh, with remote port 3478. So it starts off by setting up the peer connection in the bottom left, uh, it makes a note of every candidate pair that it sees through the R event. And then in the top right, if the ICE agent is trying to remove any candidate pair, and that happens to be the UDP 3478 pair, uh, the application prevents that from happening by canceling that event. Similarly, if the ICE agent is trying to nominate a candidate pair that isn't the UDP 3478 pair, uh, it can prevent that by calling to default. And then finally, once it does see the UDP 3478 pair, it uh, switches the transport to using that as a selected candidate pair. And then finally, it uh, it can remove uh, all of the unused candidate pairs. So that's just an example to show uh, what the API can do thus far. And then over to Peter for the new proposal. This. All right, next slide. So these are ones that do not yet have a PR. So the goal of presenting here today is to uh, see if the overall shape is one where it's OK to go make PRs for these things. So um, I've got three slides with examples and then one with what the web idea will look like that kind of are, are for all the examples. So the first example is when an application would like to know the result or the RTT of the outgoing checks. And so the proposal is to add an event on the ICE transport that lets you know, lets the web app know that an ICE check is being sent. 
And because it's cancelable, which I'll get to in the next slide, it's called on check send, not on check sent, because it's like going to be sent. And uh, the key is that you can get the time that the re check is sent, and you can get the time the, res the response is received, and you can get whether there was an error in the response. So you know if um, something went wrong, and you know if it worked, and you know how long the delay was between sending and receiving. So this allows an application to do its own calculation of which candidate pair it likes based on RTT and error and so forth. So next slide. Then if an application doesn't want to check to be sent at all for a particular candidate pair, then it can prevent that from being sent just like the others, uh, the other events that are cancelable. And next slide. By the way, the second line of this slide indicates why I like option C for the previous discussion. The, the, the line me means that this code can only be used for media translators, not data channel translators. Jesus. That's a kind of And then finally, if an application wants to send checks, then there's a new method on the ICE transport called send check, or I mean, we can debate the names, but uh, there's a method that allows it to send a check. And the, re the return value is similar to the event where it can get the time that it actually gets sent and the response that gets received and whether there's an error in the response and if, the, if a response never comes back, if, if there's just a, a loss. Next slide. So all three of these uh, can be done with this set of web IDL. Uh, like I said, there's an event on the ICE transport and a method for sending a check. The event is cancelable. And if you don't cancel it, then you get this uh, check object that lets you know when the check is sent and also when the response is received and if there's an error. I also threw in the transaction ID onto the check because in my experience writing server software that, or I should say a remote endpoint uh, that speaks with a web client. It's really nice to be able to debug ICE connectivity issues if you know the transaction ID, but that's just kind of a little bonus. So um, the discussion or the question is, is this the right shape enough that we can now proceed to write some PRs for it? Or is there something fundamentally objectionable that uh, people want to talk about? Just for the, just asking, why do you use a rabbit for, for a transaction ID? Uh, is that not the best way to just get some bytes? It's 20 bytes. Okay, so it's, uh, so it's just bytes. Yeah. Yeah, transaction ID is always just 20 bytes. That's a, that's a good thing. The uh, ice check object will be a used one, a, an object that can only be used once. The, the, the application will have to manage its own climate. Uh, no, I, the way I did it here was that, um, the, if there's a timeout, the a, ice agent will determine when a, a check times out and then the response resolves to uh, undefined or null. But okay. if we don't like it that way, we could you know, quibble about the exact API shape in the PR. But um, I thought it would be easier if the application didn't have to deal with the time. So the, this one, uh, in terms of uh, if there's no response, can that be packet loss counters? So, you know, so not only RTD, but we could also, like I sent 10, pack, 10 checks, got eight back, estimate back at loss in that sense. Yes. Yeah, the application could do that. And I, I think that would be valuable for doing things like probing different candidate pairs. You know, you're right. using one for media, but then you're kind of probing other candidate pairs to see if they're, how well they're working. That's kind of the whole point of this. Right. Okay. Thank you. Let's I like this one.
do you anticipate any issue with uh, like main file blocking and so on, or is it like uh, only not that much important if there's like uh, some latency between the, the call and the send time? You, you get it, I guess. You get the information, but uh, that's, do you think there will be an issue with uh, that window or, or not? Sorry, it was hard to understand that, but I think you were saying there would be a delay between when you call send check and when it's actually well, sent. I'm guessing you don't see doing that uh, closer to the network, like like this kind of thing. Or maybe maybe it's not. Uh, but I, I like to understand whether it's it's okay to use this API in a context where uh, you call you call the JavaScript and then it, it gets sent a little bit. Then you get the results, or your, whether it should be in a worker in some cases or not. My question. Sorry, it was hard to understand, but I think you were saying should this be in a worker? Um, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Do you, do you think like having it in the window is good enough? Uh, if you look at the program to see where the API is going to be called, is it in the Thing that in thread, which is uh, which can be stopped, or is it in the network thread, uh, and so on. That's I like to understand. I think you're you're you bring up a good point that uh, it would be nice if the RTP transport is something that you could hand control over to a worker. And I I don't know enough about workers to know how hard that would be, but I think you're right that it would be better to. Be able to control this from a worker than not have the ability to do that. Okay, I guess it's all proven out somehow because, yeah, and it's the whole front part interface that should go in a worker or not. Uh, I just want to say I quite like the shape of this. I think it's uh, it's quite convenient uh, to have one point from which uh, you can get both the check that is sent and then the response that's received. And uh, it also allows for good extensibility if we want to allow the application to send to, let's say, set specific stun attributes or something in the future, then that can be something that can be added to send check. Or if uh, we want to expose more information about uh, the stand package itself, that can go into ice check or check response. Uh, I guess the only thing I would want to bring up is, should there be a way to associate a check response with the source check? And that could be something as straightforward as adding the transaction ID into check response. Well, I, I think you would know the that when a response is tied to a check because the response you get the response from the check object. But it, you know, if we wanted to change the shape so that there's like an event that says got response and an event that says got sent check, uh, then you would need to tie them together by transaction ID. But here, at least how I have it, you only get the response from the check dot response basically. So you would know that that response is for that check. Yep. Okay, so I, I'm not hearing any objections. I'm just hearing like slight, uh, you know, uh, ideas for how to improve the shape. So I think the next step should be to make a PR and then continue discussion in the PR. Is that okay with everybody? That's good for me. All right, great. Well, I'm all, I'm all done with this topic then. <laughs> that was my last slide. Yes, you. Ten extra minutes for discussing RTP transport. All right, so RTP transport. Uh, Stefan, if you ever wanna do the presenting, just 
jump in and let me know. Sounds good. Hope you Okay, Nick. all hear me. I can hear you. All right, so next slide. So um, previously I presented on RTP transport and some of the feedback I got was that what I was presenting had too big of a gap between what we are, where we are and there wasn't an incremental approach. So uh, Stefan reached out to me and he had some ideas for how to make it a more incremental or progressive version, um, building a, you know, the easier way to get there without such a big gap. Um, but we both agreed on the reasons for the RTP transport. And so I wanted to have the first slide be a reminder of some of those. Um, some of them we talked about today, things like having your own audio codec or things like forwarding uh, of RTP from one endpoint to another, um, being able to control a jitter buffer. Sorry, can you go back? And there are others that we've talked about previously, things like being able to customize the packetization or customize your FEC or your RTX or even write your own jitter buffer to be able to do your own bit rate allocation. We did talk today about doing custom metadata that you can send uh, along with your media and also custom RTCP messages. So some of these we talked about and some of, today and some of them we talked about previously, but there's a lot of customization that would, one would want to do that RTP transport provides. So now next slide. <coughs> Sorry, next slide. So progressive version means that it works with the current peer connection and it works with the encoded streams and it works with web codecs and you can pick which parts you want to replace or keep. And it's not like uh, such a big gap between where we are. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Next slide. So here's the, the big idea is that there's a new method on peer connection called create RTP transport. It's similar to create data channel in the sense that when you call it, it causes ICE and DTLS to be set up in the local description or remote description. And um, the difference is that it also sets up SRTP, but the SRTP is different than the existing uh, audio and video senders and receivers in that you can receive all of the RTP and RTCP packets for the entire bundle group. And you can send any RTP or RTCP packet you want, as long as you do not break SRTP or congestion control. And then you also get a bandwidth estimate to know uh, how much you should send, because if you send too much, your packets may be queued or dropped. So kind of like the data channel where you can send and receive anything you want, except that it is RTP packets and RTCP packets that you send and receive. And like the data channel, you don't get to break encryption or congestion control, but otherwise you can send and receive what you want. So. Uh, Quick question, but is it the case that like data channel, you could mix like legacy RTP streams, RTP centers and receivers and this new one, or would it be like, uh, kind of new world, so you can use your connection with either the RTP console or the legacy, but not necessarily. I think we should be able to mix them in the same bundle group. And I'll, I'll show an example of that later on. But basically, uh, if you were to have an RTP transport object in the same bundle group as uh, some senders and receivers, then you would, still, you would be able to receive the packets in the RTP transport as well as through the receiver, or you'd be able to send with the caveat that you can't uh, break SRTP. So you can't reuse an SSRC sequence number rollover count um, combination. But I'll, I'll get into an example like that a little later. OK, any other questions yeah. before I? Yes. Um, uh... Ban the, you get a bandwidth estimate. There's nothing here that requires you to stay within the bandwidth, however. Is that correct? You could just blast data out, ignoring the estimates. No, if you send more, well, you could call sent more often, but your packets will be queued or dropped. 
the 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 browser will enforce the 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 congestion control. Okay. Just like if you took an SATP data channel set, it's unreliable and blasted away at it, it would just drop or it would queue up to some limit and then drop. So next slide. Carol uh, so, had, had oh. raised a hand as well. Sorry, I didn't see that. Harold? Sorry, wrong hand. Hold that. Yanivar is hands. Hands up. That's right. That's right. Okay, Yanivar. Yanivar, your mic is not working. Okay, well, I'll keep going, and then if he can get his mic working, we'll let him ask his question. So some examples of things you can do with this is that you could do your own encoding and packetizing with your own custom codec, say the plugin audio codec that we were talking about earlier. Or you could use the existing encoders from encoded streams, but then do your own packetization and sending. Or you could do the same, but apply your own custom FEC and then send. Or you could observe the NACs coming in over RTCP and then choose to do your own custom RTX behavior because maybe you want some uh, more aggressive RTX or something. I am good. OK, I'll pause then. Yanivar, you want to? Uh, sorry, yes, I had some Zoom audio issues there. Uh, my, my question was just going to be what happens if I call create RTP transport twice or many times if it's modeled on data channel. Um, I'll get to the effect that has on the SDP in a little bit, but uh, I'll make sure okay. to answer that question. Great, thanks. Uh, OK, so back to the examples. Um, you could receive packets and use your own custom jitter buffer implementation. So like that game streaming one, if it really wanted control over the jitter buffer, they could write their own jitter buffer implementation and maybe use web codecs for decode. Uh, you could receive packets and depacketize them yourself and then inject those into encoded streams so that the encoded stream still does the frame level jitter buffer, but you're doing the depacketization. Um, this would require, however, a constructor for the encoded audio frame or encoded video frame. You could observe incoming feedback and do your own custom bandwidth estimate if you think you can do a better job at bandwidth estimation than what's built in the browser, as long as you go lower than the built-in congestion control because you wouldn't be allowed to say, oh, my bandwidth estimator can do 100 megabits per second and then overcome the built-in one. You could get frames from the encoded stream, packetize them yourself, and then attach custom metadata and then send them. You could get the bandwidth est estimate from the RTP transport and do your own bitrate allocation for, say, your simulcast layers, and then control the bit rates on the RTP senders through the max bit rate uh, RTP parameter. Or you could far forward RTP packets or RTCP packets, like keyframe requests, from one peer connection to another with full control over the entire packet, uh, rather than having to rely on encoded streams uh, hackery at the frame level. So those are some examples of things we could do. Um, I'll, get, I'll show some code in a minute. Next slide. So here's what it might look like if you wanted to do custom packetization. Uh, you would call create tra RTP transport. You'd get back this transport. And then you could combine that with encoded streams to say, OK, I'll read out what is encoded built in. I'll apply my own packetizer. But instead of piping that through to go out the normal transport, I'm going to pipe it through to the RTP transport that I created. Uh, next slide. Here's an example where we do the opposite, where we receive RTP packets from the RTP transport, and then we inject uh, the encoded video frames and encoded audio frames into the uh, encoded streams. And that requires uh, a constructor for those. Next slide. 
And here's an example where if we allow the jitter buffer to be disabled on uh, encoded streams, which I think is something we would need to add, then you could not only do the depactization, but also do your own jitter buffer and decide when uh, you want to have something come out of the jitter buffer. So if you wanted to, for example, in that game streaming example, have a very constant jitter buffer delay, you could do it in, with something like this. Next slide. And uh, this is kind of, a, I was a little lazy when I wrote this, but uh, you could apply this idea to multiple uh, simulcast layers. Here, it's just one. Uh, but basically, you can get a bandwidth estimate called target send rate here uh, from the RTP transport and then decide how am I going to allocate this. In this trivial example, we just take the entire thing and give it to one simulcast layer. But you could divide them up yourself and say, OK, the lowest layer gets, uh, I don't know, an eighth and this next layer up gets a quarter and so on. But it would be under your control as opposed to right now in the browser where, you know, uh, it kind of decides for you. Next slide. So um, what does the RTP packet look like that you send and receive? Uh, it's basically a parsed RTP packet. You don't have, you don't get a, a byte buffer and then parse it yourself. Instead, you have the values that you would expect from an RTP packet, like an SSRC and a sequence number and a timestamp and a marker bit, et cetera. Um, and then when you receive it, you can read all those things. And when you go to send one, you can, you can set them. With an RTCP packet, it's a little different. Um, those are compound packets. Sorry, you can go to the RTCP packet slide. Um, those are compound packets. So you get like an array of things. Uh, and those each have a payload type and a payload subtype, sometimes called a reception report count. And then I was thinking that we would just leave the payload unparsed so that you can decide what to do and uh, you can have your own custom messages. But if that's not convenient, we could add the ability to have a parsed sender report, receiver report, et cetera. Um, I did have that in a previous uh, version of this. So next slide. Um, now getting to what it looks like when you call RTP transport and coming to that question of what happens if you call it twice. Um, this is a part where I think we would need to define it in the ITF. But the magic line is the M, M equals application and then the RTP protocol and then a star. So basically what this means is um, I want to do RTP, but I'm not saying whether it's audio or video. It could be anything. And I'm not saying what the payload types are going to be. Uh, it could be anything. So it's kind of like a wild card RTP where really you're just trying to set up the ICE, DTLS, and SRTP part of RTP. But then any other further negotiation would be up to the application to decide because the application would be free to send any payload type or header extension it wants. Except that uh, the header extensions related to congestion control need to be specified here because the application is not in control of that. They, like I said, you can't break uh, congestion control here. And you could bundle this with existing um, M lines. Uh, so you could have a an SCTP M line that would you know, be shared. And you could have other RTP M lines that would be shared. And if you called create RTP transport more than once, then it would create multiple lines of this. But I think we would need to say that those would not be in the same bundle group. I suppose we could leave it, allow them to be in the same bundle group, but then you would have two RTP transports that are effectively the same thing because both of them can send uh, whatever RTP you want, and both of them would receive all the RTP you want. Um, so we'd have to decide if what it, what it means for bundle. Uh, but you could have different RTP transports on different bundle groups. So uh, next slide. Answering Ewan's question, um, I think we could say they, these could go in the same bundle group with, say, an audio and video M line. And the way that would work is that RTP transport would be able to receive any of the audio and video packets. Uh, you would just be able to choose what to do with it, you know, you, you get like a second copy, basically. And then when you send, you can send whatever you want. Um, 
you just can't duplicate the SRTP for the from the audio and video. But you, if you wanted to send um, with the same SSRCs or MIDs or whatever, you could. So uh, that's it for my slides. Um, my big question is whether we should do something like this here or whether like the screen share did create a community group that's separate and do the work out there. Um, I've heard a lot of people say they want to do it here and that it wouldn't be as good out in a, in a separate community group. But is this incremental approach to an RTP transport something that people would be happy with doing here? I'm trying to keep uh, and, and Randall, you're first. Yeah, so um, uh, I think probably here um, in terms of where it should, the discussion should happen. Um, um, and on on the API in general, um, it basically as I think, I like the incremental approach better. Um, uh, it's basically RTP and JS um, with safety bumpers uh, for CC and so forth. Um, one thing I would say is uh, this has to be real time. This would this needs to be workers and and probably should be workers only in my opinion. Um, uh, doing this on the main thread is almost certainly the wrong thing to do. So. Okay, thanks for your feedback. That's that's good feedback. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I would second what Randall says. I think the the R and RTP, the R and RTP here is real time, and so we can already do this on data channels, which are main thread, but we have gotten concerns with that. So we, in the spec, we made data channels transferable to workers. <clears throat> Also, some of these examples here mention uh, create encoded streams, which I believe is non-standard. I think that's Chrome's main thread version of the uh, insertable streams. Uh, sorry, the WebRTC encoded transform API. And uh, I think Safari and Firefox instead implement the RTC RTP script transform. So I would love to know how it interfaces with that, especially since some of the examples seem to involve uh, communicating both with the transform API and uh, the more main thread, the rest of the peer connection API. So that seems like a challenge. But aside from that, I think uh, it, it looks interesting to be able to, to do this sort of stuff. Uh, it begs a lot of questions perhaps, but that's, uh, that's to be expected of uh, new and exciting things. So uh, I'm next on the queue, <laughs> and uh, you're also Bernard. Okay. And so, yes, this is interesting. And one thing that I started wondering about was why we don't have a GET RTP transport operator on the pair connection that allows you to get the RTP transport and do all these wonderful things to it from an existing peer connection. Is that a question you want me to answer? Uh, if, if you have, if, uh, didn't you think of it or, or did you reject it? That was what, what I was wondering about. Uh, I was trying to stay within the bounds of what STP has negotiated. So if I called get RTP transport and I haven't stuck that wildcard type <laughs> thing in the STP, then I'm bound to what is negotiated and what I can send. And maybe we could do that where we, you know, you call get RTP transport, but then if you call send and you provide an RTP packet that doesn't fit within the envelope that's negotiated, it gives you an error. Um, so that might work. So, but. I, I was trying to avoid a situation where we gave you an API that let you send any RTP packet, but then in an SDP, it said only certain RTP packets. And then it 
didn't match. I mean, I would actually be fine with that, but I think other people would not be fine with that. So I was trying to avoid that. Good, good, good answer. And of course, yes, events have to be worked out. Unlike here, I, my friends at Mozilla, I do think that experimentation on the, web, on the main thread is beneficial. But for webinar, and then you end. Yeah, so I wanted to comment about uh, workers. I do think it would be useful to allow it uh, because um, there might be, you might want to put the whole pipeline in the worker. Um, and I think what we're talking about is um, what one question which would arise there is um, is an RTP transport indivisible? Like, would, would you be able to have the receive and send pipeline on different workers? Um, if it's a single RTP transport for send and receive, then you couldn't do that. You'd have to have both, both the send and receive on the same worker. Um, so that's that's kind of a question. We encountered that with web transport, where it was it was difficult to use multiple workers uh, because the web the web transport was this kind of monolithic thing. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's something to think about. Yeah, that's a really good point, Bernard. Um, I do think we could separate them into the sender part and the receiver part because they really don't have much to do with each other. Right, right. So that's a good and point. And then you, you could transfer the sender to one worker and the receiver to another worker and, it, and have them on separate pipelines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so with the same uh, thing about uh, workers, I think it's uh, where it belongs clearly. So we, we need to investigate that. Um, Interaction with WebRTC and Connect Transform, I don't know. That's not the primary thing I, I, I would try to look at. Uh, but maybe in the future uh, we could we could look at we, we could look at that. But I, I would concentrate first on uh, like RTP transport uh, or like custom like sending side custom codecs and that's receiving side you're using web codecs as well. This is the kind of thing I would try to concentrate on. And uh, yeah, I had a third comment, but I forgot. Uh, yeah, the third comment is, so we had a discussion where we say, hey, we want to do processing at the frame level. And we have um, discussions where we're discussing, yeah, we should do things at back at level. And, uh, uh, it seems we should make a, a decision uh, at some point uh, on every one of them. I do not see how we, we could have both, basically. And uh, I wonder how we can organize somehow this discussion and, and uh, get to a decision there on uh, this, uh, this design, because that's, that's a major decision to make. The design of uh, this kind of uh, APIs. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else? I, I don't see the queue, so. Oh, it's in the yeah, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the participant list and uh, Zoom. Yeah, uh, Tim Panton. Ah. Um, I, I I do um, I like this. I think it's interesting. I, I kind of got uses for it. I wonder if you've looked at um, anybody else's APIs in this space. I'm thinking of um, Pion has a thing called Interceptors, which I think does something quite similar. Um, so it might be worth like looking at at that. And I think what what would be good if I remember it rightly, to steal from that is the ability to just get packets for a particular SSRC so that you don't have to do the demultiplexing in JavaScript. I think it would be nice to kind of demultiplex in like in the C++ and, and, and if you're only interested in the audio, then you only get the audio. Um, or, or, and I, I don't know how practical that is in your in your um, scheme, but it, it kind of feels attractive to me. 
Yeah, I, I think you're right that I am familiar with Pion and Interceptors, and I'm also familiar with uh, the LibWebRTC API for attaching to the demu RGB demuxer. So um, I, I think you're right that it would be a, a, a good optimization to, to be able to have the, the browser basically do the filtering on the packets uh, instead of in the JavaScript as a performance optimization for situations where there are a lot of packets and you only want some of them. And I think we could build that into the API. So that's good feedback. Thank you. So one thing I thought sort of when, uh, when Peter talked about uh, about uh, STP with bumpers, bumpers on them is that if you have to have okay. this additional STP thing in order to do this, then uh, using this API will prevent you from interoperating with anything that doesn't use <laughs> this API. That might be a limitation in where you can use it. And now interoperation has, has turned out to be less important than we thought it would be because everyone's talking to themselves. But if we want to, su to support interoperation, then, uh, then uh, being able to use this API without having to, to insist that both ends uh, implement it might be a good thing. Enough? Um, there was just one thing I, I wanted to mention, which is at some point we talked about composability where um, we separated creating the RTP packet from sending it. Um, that would be useful if you wanted to send the RTP packet over some other transport, like a web transport or something. So I was wondering if this was still possible or whether that had somehow fallen by the web wayside. Oh, so you're suggesting that you could just use a serialization, like create an array buffer of bytes for me. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, that doesn't seem too hard if we to be able to build in. Yeah, I mean, I, you'd, you'd have to uh, be able to supply it with an MTU. Like in the case if you were sending it over a web transport stream or something, you'd want an infinite MPU versus, you know, uh, or if it was web transport datagrams, you'd want a smaller MTU than the one that was on the wire. But uh, the quick, sorry, uh, quick response to Her the previous comment from Harold. Um, I do think we could do something where you call get RTP transport worth existing SDP and you could receive any of those packets <laughs> for the RTP transport. It's really on the send where you're constrained. Uh, and so that's where we'd have to decide what rules there are, what bumpers exist if you're using the existing SDP instead of the wildcard SDP. Sorry, Bernard, I didn't mean to cut off your comment. So. I got Eric from this. Uh, so I wanted to ask about uh, the header extensions. You mentioned that uh, the, like the transport CC extension is going to be handled externally. So is the idea that I serialize or to be packed put in my own extensions there, and it done, and it's going to unparse it and add another entry in the list? And... No, no. The idea, the idea is you provide the unserialized values, your SSRC sequence number, timestamp, payload, header, the pairs of ID and header extension values you want. And then it adds, the browser being it, adds whatever header extension it needs for congestion control, which in many cases will be the transport CC. Uh, and then it serializes it and encrypts okay. it. And so, you, can't, so you can't Perfect. control that, that header extension because then you'd be able to mess with awesome. the congestion control. Gotcha, thanks. Sorry, I raised my hand again. So um, this, this might be a detailed comment at this stage, but uh, I do notice on the slide it says on RTP packet. 
And so um, I want to make sure we don't repeat the mistake of WebSocket that had on message, where there's no back pressure, uh, where the if the JavaScript client, if the JavaScript receiver cannot keep up, it just means it's you're building up JavaScript buffers. Uh, so it might be better to to have an API that at least even if there's not back pressure in RTP, at least lets the the browser receive buffer know that JavaScript isn't keeping up. Yeah, we're gonna have to discuss. Uh, you know, do we use wet WZ streams or do we use events and that kind of thing? On yeah. some of the examples, I used a dot. I think I had a dot writable. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're gonna have to have that discussion, but. That is a little bit, a little bit down the road. All right, cool. So, so were there any other hands? Any other folk? So I don't see anyone else on the queue. I. Uh, so my sense of the room is that, yes, there is much interest. The most important to the loudest uh, thing raised is that we need to sort out the, the thread story. That is worker thread versus uh, main thread versus not main thread. And uh, what objects need to either have their Lifetime extended or be able to be designed as this decide as transferable. And uh, another uh, discussion thread is about this uh, whether we want interrupt or whether we want uh, want just uh, special applications. Uh, but. My sense is that yes, we should continue on this work, and uh, that uh, the people in this room, who are kind of, kind of a biased selection though, uh, kind of uh, favor doing it here. That common sense. That sounds about right, according to the notes I took and. Sounds great to me. I'm happy to continue uh, driving the discussion, uh, making more specific proposals, and integrating the feedback so far into those. So, the first item on the list is to is to describe the threading model. Describe yeah. a threading model. Did we create a new document or use an extension, existing extension document? I think this should. This is big enough that it should be getting a new document. Okay. Great. Seven minutes ahead of the schedule. Now I'm going to speak. I'm not going to manage the queue very well for a while. So. We presented the SDP negotiation at the previous meeting. Got some uh, fossil noises uh, saying that yes, this uh, looks workable. Let's continue continue discussion on the on the bug and on the TR. There wasn't that much discussion on the TR. But uh, just to recap, uh, the model of SDP negotiation is that we exchange SDP, offer answer, and that co configures the available code lists in the encoder and the packet access. And we have set parameters that allows to set, uh, set code preferences for that matter, that allows to set parameters allows you to pick the codec specific. I want to use this codec from that list. That's a very new API. But uh, in the case where we have a transform, the transform sits between the encoder and the packetizer. Now in strictly in the model of, uh, of, a, of, of a single transform. Uh, 
And STP of, of Ramster will configure the encoder and the packetizer without knowing about the transform, without caring about the transform. That means that, that we're effectively lying about what we're sending and, and not telling the truth is usually leads to a great deal of confusion. So we need some new functionality. So the API was that I described two months ago was that before negotiating with a peer, both sides of the application using a transform should tell STP negotiation the name of the codec that they want to use, the name that, that they want to use on the stuff that is sent on a wire after the transform and before the uh, other side transfer. It doesn't matter what they call it, but the two sides have to agree on the names. And if the, they agree, then the offer answer by no change to the current rules will assign a payload type for that particular payload. Okay, now we have a uh, Codec that the platform doesn't know anything about. And we have payload type assigned to it. And we have an encoder that encodes video frames or audio frames according to what it does. And that encoding has a payload type, which is a different type. So before we start sending data, we have to tell the encoder what the encode to explicitly. The transform has to know what data to expect, and we have to tell the transform what payload type it needs to assign to the to the frames after the transform. The same way on the receiving the same side, we will get packets in from the network in a new payload type. We need to tell the transform that this is the payload type you want, you expect. And it needs to tell us from what payload type to produce so that the decoder can do the right thing. And tell the decoder that this, you need to decode these frames using this algorithm. And the transform transforms. So I made two changes or proposed two changes since, since the July presentation. One is the that I had the set codec operator, which and a, a packetizer attribute to on the on the codec we negotiated. And by the way, the set codec uh, API works. I decided that the simpler way is to tell the packetizer explicitly, "You're going to do this this packetization for this payload." Type. Another discussion I had was about mind packs. So, because the payload type is in a way a short, shorthand for a mind pack. And the mind pack is the name that uniquely identifies this particular encoder format. So, a frame in the current spec. Is tagged with a, mind, with a payload type, but not the mind type. It's assumed that anyone who wants to to understand what this payload type means will have access to the SDP and be able to do the decoding from that. We also get can get parameters. Uh, but if the metadata that we're setting up, we're reading and setting on the frame was the mind type and not the payload type. Then it could allow the encoder, decoder, packetizer, depacketizer to run with uh, just producing the mind types. And the payload type mapping did, wouldn't have to be something that the transfer care about. We've had other reasons to add frames to add the, add the mind types to the frames. 
for other reasons, but we haven't done so done it so far. It's still pain with that. So yeah. this is a shine about about that description. More text, just more more or less more text. So the three questions in front of the room are really are we still okay with pursuing this particular approach? And that's the end of I'll say yes. Uh, are we okay with the approach of telling the packetize of packetize according to the specific rules? And should we switch from halo type to mind type when it comes to identifying which rules, with which content a frame has. This gets, and we have, uh, so, uh, so Hendrik and Bernard and Yadira on the queue, and you are so sorry. Hendrik? My only, like, whatever the API is, we just need to make sure that if you flip flop between different codecs, that the codec switch and the title type switch happens at the right time, so that there isn't a race. But uh, the approach makes sense to me. You should. The configuration will happen before you start sending data. But now, yeah. Um... One one of the things that we found that's kind of interesting is the um, the behavior of the packetizers isn't always that well defined. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll give you a weird example. Uh, Fippo discovered that the H two six four packetizer does not drop uh, now units it doesn't understand. That's turns out it could be a useful property, but it's also not a property that's defined anywhere. Um, so it, it, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about potential non-interoperability, which could um, der be derived here, unless we specify what some of these things do a little bit more. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a payload type called SIP in the idea that seems to be a, to have useful properties like this, this is a frame. Don't touch it. Don't mess with it. So uh, there's a non-standard factorization mode in the in Chrome called Raw, which has a, approximately the same property, but it's single in a non-standard way, which <laughs> may not. That's that's. That's, that's historical reasons. I want I want to replace it with something better. So packetizers are an interesting subject as being less well defined than we thought of. Janiva. Yeah, so so my comment was also about uh, questions around packetizer, and it's not I agree it's not well defined. It seems to be the way we talk about it when we say the H.264 packetizer, we're saying the packetizer that this codec uses, uh, which I guess in the context of <clears throat> end to end encryption is quite reasonable and understandable because it's the underlying codec that we're encoding on top of, right? And so it makes sense, I guess, to keep the packetizer the same, but it's still a little, um, the API still feels overly flexible for the use case of merely signaling what we're doing in with end-to-end -end encryption. So I'm wondering if it solves also solves some of the, it's not cl cl super clear how you would use it uh, to avoid some of the issues we have with encoded transform. Like uh, if you're using H.264, for example, you quickly find out that there are certain bytes you can't touch, otherwise uh, you know, things don't work and nothing happens. So I'm wondering, yeah. yeah. yeah there's, the, 
the approach I see as most likely with uh, end-to-end encryption is that you either set the, set the packetizer to one that is known to have minimum interference with the packet contents. For instance, we found that the VP8 packet, the packetizer, tries to parse the packet in order to extract the QP value from the frame because it wants to know that before it starts decoding it. It's a, it was a weird design decision. Hmm. And of course, the HTTP4 packetizer, the packetizer the packetizer is not behaving terribly well when you give it uh, non h 64 data. So I want eventually to have a have a raw raw packetizer that I can, can tell the platform to set that doesn't do anything. It might be, it might be named skip with, if Bernard Bernard might have commentary on that, or it might be named something else. <laughs> skip right. folks would love that. <laughs> and I also. I also had some questions about some methods that were in the previous meeting, but they're not in the slide. So, but uh, but also just in isolation, switching from payload type to mime type seems like an improvement to me. So you're saying about mime type? Uh, that seems like an improvement to me. Uh, the payload types always seem like a low level thing. Uh, Randall. Yeah, I was just going to make a comment on the payload type to MIME type thing. I mean, I, I don't know what you're buying by doing that. I understand that, like, okay, MIME types are sort of uh, a higher level concept, but it's just, it's really, you can't use arbitrary things. You have to use something that's been negotiated. Um, it's basically just a lookup. Um, so, you know, it appear. Uh, you know, I I don't know the advantages, and I suppose it's a small perf thing, but I don't think it matters a great deal either way. Yeah, the for not for the encoder, not for the strict encoder transfer, but for the for the relay use case uh, that was described earlier. Uh, Using the MIME type would actually avoid having to think about whether or not the two pair connections have, the, have assigned the same payload type to the same MIME format. So that's a slight uh, architectural cleanup. But, I mean, uh, the, the, there's certainly a, neg a small negative performance impact in that comparing integers is strictly faster than comparing strengths. Yes, but, uh, and you're, you're doing it a lot. <laughs> yeah. You're doing it once per frame. But of, but, but of course, you, you can optimize that by passing the same object every time and looking at, looking at the object instead of looking at the strings. That's the kind of implementation hack yeah. that could be performed. Yeah, I mean. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, end-to-end frame registration suggested for other reasons. Can you elaborate on the other reasons? Might have. Well, you said that it was suggested to end-to-end frame for other reasons. What were the reasons? The other reasons. Yeah, what are the other reasons? No, I, I, I have forgotten. Fippo asked to add it because he, he wanted to have the information readily, readily available to transform without having to look up the PP. And, but I have forgotten what this use case was. I, I should have included the number of his uh, issue. It's probably somewhere. Uh, let me see. Eric? This is a dumb question, but are there MIME type mappings for all uh, payload types? You can't create a payload type without the MIME type. Okay. 
to get stuck. That was the cue. Yeah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so failure type my I, I would like to stick to failure failure type myself. Um, I don't think you need for the specific cases of web uh, web design control. I don't think you actually need to change it. Uh, the user agent can handle it because it knows the encoder and it knows the packetizer. And if you change the packetizer uh, anyway, it, it, it will know how to probably do the mapping itself. Um, I think it's good to be able to switch from packetizer to another. Uh, we need that for S train, for instance, when you are actually starting S train or Italy S train. So, one question would be uh, how much flexibility do we want to, to do it? Do we, do we want it to do per frame or do we want, do we want it to do like just once? Uh, that's a question uh, that would be right in how the API would be, would be shaped. Uh, there's the error mechanism, because I don't think we want like to allow uh, a frame that is less than four to be packetized by the VBA uh, packetizer. So that, that's, that's, a quick, that's a design decision there that we should make. Uh, I don't think we should go there, at least initially. Um, I think the main goal here is you select H264, you're doing a transform, and instead of using the H264 packetizer, you want to use the genetic packetizer, but at some point, the ATF will standardize. Uh, so it's it's almost a binary decision. Like, am I using the one I'm negotiating, or am I using the, the new packetizer that solves everything? So maybe in the future, it will not be binary, but uh, so, yeah, if we, if we press on that, then it's a different API. Um, but in any case, I, I think, yeah, if you're going to set a packetizer that is not matching with what you're actually uh, encoding, then it, there should be some error mechanism there. Uh, so, so, uh, so we're setting the packetizer that will handle the stuff that exists after the transform. And if the transform isn't just a NOAA, then what came in as EPA will no longer be the EPA. And what came in as H264 will no longer be H264. Yeah, and uh, basically we need, we need a genetic packetizer and maybe the API will be, uh, hey, use genetic packetizer, and that's it. Yes, so one, one, so one reason for the, for the current design is that we don't have it yet, so I didn't want to create a dependency. Yeah. The other one is that so, well, we have kind of survived with uh, using Standard packetizers for a while now. And I'd like to be interoperable with what we have, sort of. You want to be interoperable? I don't want to have. What? I want to, to deploy this API in browsers and have, and have them be able to interoperate with uh, what's currently out there. Sure, then when we have when we have a genetic fertilizer in like say a year, two years, hopefully we'll have it sooner. Then we will have deployed something that is not useful anymore. So uh, it, will, it will be useful until all the, all the old stuff has come away. So, yes, I, I would prefer that we we would have the Universal packetizer to, to and use that API. Structurally and not. So, when are you suggesting an entire different stack for? Uh, well, it, it could be a. Uh, it could be a. Uh, well, I would look precisely at the API that uh, instead of set packetizer, it could be set packetizer binary. And if there's an n in, and there would be just one n value. Which would be a ITF generic packetizer level. It's sort of equivalent, but uh, more interested in the uh, in the list of packetizer that it is. Yep. One one way would be to have the packetizer argument be a string, and then 
just define a couple of useful values now and, uh, and say that we can add row when it arrives. So identifying the pack passer is noted as an open item. And, uh, switch from PT to MIME type. I see PT logging on both sides of that one. And Pantheon is on the queue, sorry. Yeah, I'm kind of, I may be a little early to be saying this, but I, I wonder how this relates to the proposal that Peter's just made. So it feels like there's a kind of big piece of overlap in that. It would be nice to see maybe some of the same concepts appear in, in one that would be usable in the other, like, you know, packetizers, for example. Like, it would be nice if whatever you create in an API for packetizers here is something that could be used in Peter's API or, or maybe the other way around, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think of them as some of our problem because the main, main thing with this API is to, is to control the SDP negotiation and how the SDP negotiation controls the, controls the encode, encode and uh, encode, decode, packetized, defectized process. While uh, Peter's proposal really goes to, uh, goes to what happens with the packets after they have been packetized. And before they were depackaged, and so we should be careful to make sure that there's some alignment between them on what the what the down what the underside of the packetizer and the and the top side of the transport look like, but. Uh, I don't see them as greatly overlapping them. I, I, I guess what I'm really saying is that they feel like tools that I would use together in the same application. And so it'd be good if the APIs were somewhat congruent, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's too early to know that. Yeah, I, I also like to keep them independent in the sense that if one takes a year longer, then, then the other one shouldn't be delayed. This one would be the web extension transport sort of extension. Well, Peter is orthogonal to web extension. I could see them being done in the What's the summary of the discussion there? For the so, uh, so, on the switch from meet to the mind type, and note, uh, arguments on both sides, setting back to I think the, <coughs> I think the, 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 I think the general principle is, uh, is uh, accepted, but how to identify the back is still a bit, uh, needs, needs further discussion. Topic to be defined. I need I need to reload this Reddit because uh, that's that's not what we what we can the shy can discuss just about. No? I think you need to reload the uh, reload the uh, slides. Yeah, so then they've showed up. Yep. So back back to the web the extended use cases, which was the first one we had to, had to cut, cut out. Right. So um, the next uh, use case in section three two is the low latency broadcast with fan out. So this is what it looks like currently uh, with N fifteen and N thirty nine. Um, now, one thing we had discussed in July was that this is a little this lacks some clarity because it used the word low latency and in 
the issue that was a question of what that meant exactly. And also that was confusing because it was mixing uh, potentially quite different uh, use cases. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Next slide. So Harold, do you wanna to talk to this one? Yeah, this is uh, what, uh, what drove the, the, the thing that Palak was uh, describing earlier. Uh, moving frames between PCs, structured uh, clone frames, and modify metadata. And uh, we'll discuss this, we can skip it. Yeah, so this slide came from July. Is is this still the uh, proposed requirement edition or is uh, there gonna be some other PR? I think this is still the proposed requirement change, yes. Okay. All right, so uh, can we have an action item to actually submit that as a PR? Yes. Okay, so I did want to um, talk about PR 123, which is an attempt to clarify this low latency broadcast case. Um, so next slide. All right, so um, this use case originally was submitted by Tim Panton. And at the time when it was originally uh, submitted, it was focused on auctions and betting. And that isn't just low latency, that's ultra low latency. And what I mean by that is glass to glass latency less than 500 milliseconds. And that's actually an important clarification because we see uh, web registry is actually popular for that. That's what WIP and WEP are for or used for. And also it helps distinguish it from some other cases because if you're trying to get to that latency, data channel fan out may not be what you want. Um, now that's for a couple of reasons. One is that you may not be able to handle the ordered reliable mode um, because of all the retransmissions. But even in the unreliable unordered transport, um, it, it might add uh, too much latency because then you have to do your own uh, potential retransmission and or something like a custom FEC and the other aspect of it is, is if you're doing that, most likely you're not using a raw uh, format. You're using something like CMAF, and that adds the overhead of CMAF containerization, decontainerization, um, which is kind of wasteful if DRM is not needed. Um, and also you're probably not rendering with, you may not be rendering with WebRTC, you would be rendering with low latency MSC, which isn't standardized, and so the latency can vary. So the point we're trying to make here is that um, the distinction calling this ultra low latency clarifies that it's really not about that kind of data channel form, uh, fan out. And also the data channel fan out requirements are covered elsewhere, like the file sharing use case in section 3.1 has a requirement for data channel on workers. And the IoT use case has a requirement for um, control over max retransmissions timeout which would be something you would use for like a partially reliable uh, uh, unordered transport. So uh, basically what we wanna do is, is clarify that we're really talking about ultra low latency here and also motivate uh, some of the requirements that Harold just mentioned uh, to make it clear that this isn't data channel form, uh, fan out. Next uh, slide. So this is the proposed PR123 basically changed the name of the use case to ultra low latency broadcast with fan out. Um, clarify that that is a glass to glass latency less than 500 milliseconds and um, focus on the auctions, betting and financial news, which are the ultra low latency rather than throwing in uh, other stuff like webinars and a company town hall, which um, actually can take considerably higher latency and can be done with data channel fan out. Um, But the other, a lot of the uh, other requirements remain the same, like the limited inter interactivity, the natraversal, stuff like that. And I also removed Pier 5 because that's a data channel fan out uh, implementation. Uh, Dolby is, is uh, 
whoever does he based streaming. So it's more in the ultra low latency category. I don't know about pipe. Any comments on this PR? So did you try, were you trying to remove the RPC data channels from, from, uh, from the experience line? Uh, well, I wanted to clarify this use case wasn't about data channel fan out because it wouldn't meet the latency requirements. So that's why I removed peer five because that's a data channel fan out. Uh, uh, I, was that's, that's you, fan out. I was wondering if you wanted to remove data channel from uh, line three five nine. Oh yeah, actually that that's a good uh, yeah that's a good idea, uh, Harold. Yes, it, that should uh, that should be removed. Yes. To be transported via RTP, not data channel. I have uh, Yaniva on the queue. Uh, yes, so, um, uh, so yes, removing the data channel, I guess. Um, begs the question of, are these um, new use cases, is the fact that something's already solved, is that, are we not tracking those use cases anymore? Um, and I guess I'm finding the way, just uh, a clarification of whether we should remove data channel there. Uh, also, when we say ultra low latency, uh, it's still a bit confusing to me because you know WebRTC is usually you know, less than 100 milliseconds. So what do we call that? So is that real time? And then ultra low latency is 100 to 500. Um, but as long as we include numbers, maybe that might be easier if we include the numbers in the uh, PR. Yeah, I assumed it was, it was a little bit more late, potentially more latency than WebRTC because of the fan out. Um, Usually when I think of WebRTC, I think of some going, you know, the packets traveling from the conferencing unit to the browser without being peer-to-peered -peer, uh, along the way. So that's why I made it 500 milliseconds. Um, that's also the point at which, um, you know, it, it was also to try to clarify that it's not something like HLS with a data channel fan out, that that wouldn't, wouldn't fit in there. I guess removing the data channel might also clarify that. Um, okay. um, so question on, uh, so you're saying it's RTP transport that is used. So I get it, but it's RTP from uh, the initial sender to, to one person in the network. And then the sign to other persons. Uh, the second link, maybe data channel or maybe RTP transport, or is a use case specifically so that it's RTP transport for both the first link and the second link. Because I could see data channel being passed up in some networks for the second link, but the first link must be RTP transport. Yeah, that, that's a good question is, does it have to be RTP all the way through? I think the main thing was that it couldn't be CMAF all the way through because of the the MSC and the CMAF would add too much latency to, to make this make sense. Um, Web codex, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you could, you uh, as an example, uh, UN, you could, you could depacketize the RTP and uh, shuffle it around as a frame and, uh, that, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's probably adds latency, but, um, you know, then that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be RTP. It would be more like Peter's web codex thing, but uh, it wouldn't have the same kind of latency that CMAF or MSE would. So that brought, that might work. Uh, So uh, at least the example that you're mentioning, Python, Dolby, they're, they're doing like the RTP transport for both the first and the second X. Yeah, I couldn't, so, couldn't, couldn't quite hear that. Uh, so, with, yeah. 
So, you're so, just... so I can answer that because I've been playing with both. Um, they're RTP. The, um, both hops are RTP only. There's no point oh, in which sure. they are. Um, I mean, at some point, somebody will build a frame so that put it into a cache or something so for retransmission purposes. But but it's essentially RTP from the first hop to the second and 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 onwards. So each and it may in the end. If it's a big fan out, may end, end up being like three hops, but all of those hops are, are pure RTP. Yeah. If, if you are RTP from the beginning to the end, you're, you're forwarding packets. And if you're uh, starting to forward frames, then in the middle, then, then the question. And then it's a different solution as well. So that's why I'm trying to figure out whether this use case is covering both or it's, whether it's not really relevant. And maybe Pipe and Dolby, since they're, they're even implementing this use case, uh, you can precise the use case of, yeah, it's from the beginning to the end and it's fast forwarding, or it's like, yeah, you can have some delays in the morning as well. I'm finding the audio pretty hard to um, uh, understand, I'm afraid, but... Um... Uh, I'll comment on the GitHub issue. Okay. Well, Tim, can you give us your opinion since this was your use case? Well, um, yeah, I mean, it was a while ago uh, when, when I raised it. I, I think it's still, I mean, there's an interesting... Um, like there's a genuine interest in this and, and in in low enough latency for either, I mean, for these environments. And I think the only way to achieve it is is RTP with as little manipulation as possible on the way through. And, and we've just built the thing for um, pit crews to watch over the shoulder of drivers in race cars. And like, they really know if, if you're more than a quarter, I mean, they know if you're a quarter of a second behind, but they can live with that because um, they've got real time radios and less than real time video. And so like, it's really perceptible. And then the fan out is that other people in the crew also want to watch it, um, maybe up in the stands or whatever. So it's quite a, um, it's a bit of a niche that we're dealing with. I mean, Dolby's obviously doing something on a much bigger scale, but, but in that environment, um, we don't want to have a server there. We don't want to have like massive infrastructure um, to have to deliver to a pit or you know, backstage or whatever it get, ends up getting used, uh, backstage in the house or something like that. So, um, I mean, maybe phrase the question somewhere on a PR and I can like answer it in detail, but that's my current feeling. I think there's still a thing here that's good to have in the document. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you, if you can review the PR, that would be great. Right. Uh, do we have any more slides here? Let's see. Uh, I guess that's it for this. Uh... Oh, careful, we might let you out early. So Bernard, do you want to, to, to summarize the next steps as you see? Uh, well, I think this, this section was uh, uh, in next steps for the use case. Oh, you know, five minutes. Yes, overall. Okay. So, for, for this, I think next step is to. Some comments on the GitHub issue. Okay. So, continue discussion on all GitHub issues. 
Pero, bueno, sin tanto más. Okay, so this is the last section before we wrap up. Uh, and uh, I guess it was intended to be just to uh, keep track of things that we need to do going forward, next steps, actions, CFCs, stuff like that, um, as a result of what we've talked about today. So we haven't uh, decided on any CFCs that I have heard so far. We have a number of PRs that uh, where we have suggestions for improvements or things that need to be discussed a little bit further. But I don't see them as uh, see any of the things we have discussed there as being fundamentally blocked. And get, get on. Except that we have to have a discussion on uh, whenever you answer us. We want to take two steps back and think about this and that. <laughs> but I'd like to at least move forward. And we can. I, I think uh, individual presenters probably know their own action items to some extent. There was some discussion of, of new documents, though, and, and hopefully that's captured in the minutes. Uh, yeah, so, we wanna... so we have the, the transport draft seems to be a clear candidate for a new document. Right. The chairs create that document, or how does that work? So the so the I think the standard person is to. Create an, an official draft and then ask for adoption. So, in the memory process, there. Then, they, then they have to ask for a working group last call for, for, for adoption, as, and then they can have first public working group, first public working draft, SPWD. And then after that, it turns into a working draft, and then we work on it. Until the stop working. So, anything else? I just remind that remind you all that we have more meetings to give us a chance to rehash issues or find new ones. Including a couple of uh, slots tomorrow. And that uh, have our breakout sessions that should be of interest to us. HDR on the web, web public civilization, web art is a use case, that, that, that is one of that I need, really need to read up on. Because if it's a use case session, then, uh, then we ought to think about whether we can capture the use cases. Really? Then you have another. Yeah, I had a proposal for web workers' quality of service. So uh, I moved it to a breakout to get a wider audience because right now we have only experimented with web RTC people, Zoom and Google Meet. But it's, it's basically uh, all the CPUs are now heterogeneous in a big little course. Uh, workers have no way to give any hint below if you want to optimize for performance if you optimize for power there are a few other things so there were quite a few options where workers would have been an idea so 
Yeah, that's one of the proposals. So when, when is? Uh, I just got my time changed, so it should be just after break, fourteen thirty, in the performance track. Okay. Then, and then we have joint meeting with SCG and joint meeting with media, and by that time it's Friday. In between, you can get it yeah. Okay. Season, folks. I'm still recording now.